Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome to the Co-Optional Podcast on the 7th of March 2017. Yeah. Yes, indeed. This is the date. It is the date. That is the date, I think. One can confirm that that is, in fact, the date. We started off well with accuracy. Real news. Real news. No fake news here. It's not fake. News you can trust right here from the Co-Optional Podcast. I should take this time to inform you of our new end-user license agreement, which yes, requires you to stay for the entire duration of the show. And if you fail to do so, then you will be charged with trademark infringement. And also, well, we will not issue you a refund for this podcast. Just thought I'd in order to watch there. it, isn't it like yeah? In order to watch the podcast, it's fifty dollars per episode as part of the EU LA. I, I believe that is part of it. Yeah, um, I don't. I haven't actually read uh, Eula. It okay. was copy pasted from an Exxon Mobil press release, mm. so I'm not a hundred percent sure. But I'm fairly sure that's in there somewhere. Like the top minds, <laughs> smart people have told me this. I'm positive that this is definitely. What was said in there? Without question. I haven't read it, but I positive. <laughs> Indeed. All, Speaking all of haven't imagine. read it, our sponsor today is Audible. Audible.com slash cynical to get oh your God. free audiobook because well reading done. takes you too can much get effort. An audiobook of Total Biscuit reading you the EULA. Holy crap. That is like a money making machine. No, it's not going to happen. <laughs> every, time, every time TV says our top men, I just imagine them. <laughs> Some guy pushing a giant thing of paper Man. down into it, like a bunch of boxes where the lost ark is. We've yeah. got our top guys on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Putting it deep underground where we'll never yeah. find it again. Yeah, that's probably for the very important. Mm -hmm. Genius. We'll be giving you a few recommendations for audiobooks from Audible a little bit later on in the show as part of our sponsor obligation. It's also a nice little excuse for us to talk about books for 10 minutes, which no. is a lot of fun. I enjoy that. I've been listening to quite a lot of audiobooks as of late. I've been sort of out of action for a while, as some people are probably well aware. I've been having fun surgery, by which I mean not fun surgery. I was going to say. <laughs> not, that doesn't not sound right. part, part of your surgery's ULA was you must say it was fun you at must all say times. It's fun. Indeed, yes. <laughs> and I'm definitely not getting a refund from that, I can tell you. But yes, I, I was a bit worried about coming on the show because laughing still hurts, but then I remembered it's a co-optional podcast and there's not much chance of that. So no, yeah. thank God we're not funny. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah. under any circumstances. So I'm not not too worried about that. That sh that should be absolutely fine. I was unfortunately put in a situation where I wasn't able to game a lot, and so I ended up watching a lot of movies, most of which didn't end up being particularly great. Although there's one that stuck out as worse than everything else, and that is Kickboxer Vengeance. Never Do not. That. that sounds like that would be. <laughs> it doesn't Do sound like that's good at all. Look, I got a soft spot for Jean-Claude Van Damme, all right? Oh, fuck. oh God. <laughs> I think well, we all do. Problem so, one. Somewhere deep within our soul, we all have a soft spot for Jean-Claude Van Damme. And I was interested Man's in watching- got an ass. I'm just saying. Terrible movie. <laughs> Man's got an ass. He can do the splits. It's crazy. He, you, don't, he, you don't fight that love. It's called Kickboxer Vengeance, you said? Vengeance, That sounds like yeah. it's a sequel. Like he's it, on a vengeance from whatever happened Well, in he's that not movie the main one. character. That's the thing. He's, which it's, it's one of those good old, well, our uh, main character from this storied series is too old now so let's have him be the mentor of a new character uh, yes of course uh, so it's it's creed but a i was gonna say it's creed, creed. Very, it's a shitty version of creed yeah, yeah yeah you know i i like and i enjoy bad movies let's just put it that way i i i do they're, they're nice mush for the brain but this one just bothered me too much it half the reason i watched it is because the villain quote unquote is uh but dave batista who was also in Guardians of the Galaxy and was, right. you know, former WWE champion. So, like, hey, I'll watch it because, you know, he's fun to watch. The entire movie makes no damn sense. It, <laughs> and you'd think it would be fairly easy to put the plot together for something like this. It's not a hard concept. For a movie called Kickboxer Vengeance. Yeah, you, you would think. Yeah. You, you would think. And here are spoilers for Kickboxer Vengeance. I'm doing you a favor, trust me. <laughs> that it, we, we, it opens up with this guy saying, hey, I'm now karate champion of the world and I've got a lot of money and I own my own gym and everything's cool. And then some person he knows comes along and says, well, there's this really dangerous, deadly fighting tournament going on in Thailand. You should definitely go to it. And oh, it's also, you know, the champion is a Muay Thai guy and you're totally not and you're karate, but hey, you can totally take him anyway. Also, you might die, but there's a lot of money in it. So go anyway. And he's like, yeah, sure. Yeah. It sounds reasonable. 
Um, I'll go train Muay Thai for three weeks with some random dude Only in three weeks. in Thailand, and I expect to be able to take this guy on. Of course, he gets killed in the death match, as you might imagine. And his brother, who one assumes is even less experienced and competent in martial arts, decides to go and get revenge. It's like, right, well, okay, well, that ah. seems like a terrible idea. Your brother vengeance. was... A, was a vengeance. <laughs> Your brother it. was a way better fighter <laughs> in the first place. He uh-huh. got wrecked. He got totally wrecked. Like, I'm going to get revenge. I was like, all right. So he gets into the champion's secret school, as it were, Ooh. mostly mm-hmm. by just bribing his Did way in. Did he get in. the golden ticket? I don't know. He, he, the, the, the door guard was drunk, so it can't have been that much of a secret school. <laughs> he gets in, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, this is kind of, this is kind of neat. Maybe he's just he's going to learn his ways and then be able to beat him at his own game, right? No, the first night he brings out a gun. God knows how he got that into fucking Thailand. It was uh, either Thailand or Hong Kong, neither of which... <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, getting a firearm in either of those countries is not impossible, incidentally. If you remember playing, <laughs> if you remember playing Sleeping Dogs, it's like, yeah, uh, you can't. There's no, there's almost no guns in that game because of where it's where it's set. And then he gets his ass kicked anyway because he he doesn't. He ends up hesitating, not shooting the guy. And the guy, the villain, makes a fairly valid point, saying your your brother was a warrior and I respected him. You're just a coward. I was like, yeah, he actually he is. Isn't Damn. He? <laughs> it's like, that's, that's actually fairly valid. Th- then he gets arrested by the police, deported. And by deported, that means they take him to the airport and say, get on this plane. And then they just leave. <laughs> and that's they, how it works. Yeah. He, they he goes, just come up to you casually and they say, could you get on this plane, though? Yes. We as need so- you to leave. As someone that has actually been deported, trust me, they do not. And he goes down the gangway, turns around, and walks back out the airport. I was like, wow, what a the cunning cops, scheme. Did the cops, like, drive to the airport and just, like, all right, you can go. They pretty like, much dropped pretty him much. off like a cabbie. <laughs> yeah, they, like, give him a sack lunch. <laughs> pretty much. Have a good ride. He ends up with, um, uh, with the trainer of his brother. Gets mad initially at the trainer. It's like, my brother died because of you. It's like... Yeah, the, the, he only asked for three weeks of training and then took on the best Muay Thai dude in the world in the death match. Of course he fucking lost. It's like, the, literally nobody to blame. Goes through a giant training montage. In the meantime, incidentally, the police have figured out that he hasn't left the country, but they're okay what? with it. They're entirely okay <laughs> How did they with figure it. figure that out? <laughs> they, 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 they spotted him at one point and like, oh, well, as long as you oh. stay at the trainers, I guess we're okay with it. But like, hold what? on. It wasn't even what? that they like checked the records of the airport. They saw him walking and they're like, Holy crap, he hasn't left our country. What, what? the fuck? <laughs> we dropped him off at the airport yesterday at noon. It's probably probably got a lot to do with the fact that the main character ends up banging the lead detective. I assume uh, that's... Uh, that's got that'll give it away. All, that, look, all you need to know is this movie's only... I posted it in chat because I want everyone to know. The only thing that the first movie is known for these days, the first kickboxer, is the infamous Jean-Claude Van Damme dancing scene in which... <laughs> God. He does the most ridiculous. I'll post it again in case you guys literally it's just like the craziest like shoe bop dance followed by like an action martial arts shoe scene. Bop and it is that's the only way to describe it. Like he, he dances like a background singer to a Motown band. It's how hey. he dances. And it oh, is man. beautiful. That is 100 percent the only reason to know the first movie. So the bar set very, very high for this one. I'm, I, I will like, watch it. I Van will Damme watch is it. probably the only thing that makes this movie even remotely enjoyable. Uh, it goes on like this. And by the end, he gets into the deathmatch fight with the champion, despite the fact that there's really no way in a million years you could ever beat him. Of course, he overcomes the odds after getting his, the shit kicked out of him for two rounds, including a round where the guy's fist is covered in broken glass. So, I saw that in the trailer. I was like, plus, plus one damage. The Batista is basically kicking the shit out of him. Bear in mind, this is an illegal deathmatch fight. The police show up during round one, don't arrest anybody, and <laughs> just stand there watching. And by the end of it, the comeback happens, and the main character murders in cold blood the champion in revenge. The police do nothing about this whatsoever, and then... The police chief and this guy ride off into the sunset on a boat while Van Damme waves at them. That's great. Thailand, wait, wait, is, a wi- wait, Thailand is a wild stay? place. He just stays. Yeah. He's not waving. He's like, come on. It, it's committed first degree murder in an illegal death match, but no, it's fine. It, totes <laughs> fine. Not a problem. It's all good. It, it's bizarre because like, I felt so much sympathy for the villain because the villain wasn't even a villain. The villain literally did nothing bad the entire movie. 
Like, okay, he, he killed a dude, but he did it that was a in a death match yeah. that they both knew was a death match. And he even acted honorably in his, like, school and everything and was respectful and didn't do anything underhanded. It's like, the villain is the white guy. <laughs> the, the stupid fucking I trained to be world class uh, fucking Muay Thai in three weeks white guy under Jean Claude Van Damme is the bad guy. And Batista's <laughs> evil character was actually totally honorable the entire time. I'm going to need everyone oh on the internet, everyone to tweet right now, in quotes, the villain was the white guy, total person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, it was, it was bad, man. It was... Yeah, this sounds like a really bad video game. It's, what else have you yeah. guys been playing? Yeah, let's, let's move on to that. <laughs> right? There are Good plots God. of video games that are worse than this, but they're pretty hard to find, I have to admit. Most of them are I don't know, horrible. man. <laughs> Steam's new release list every single day. You find yeah, the plot. Yeah, we, we, did, we did a little bit of culling. It wasn't that bad this week. Uh, Jesse did the culling this week, so you get to blame him if you missed your favorite waifu video game or whatever. I That's like why. that we've been rotating. Yeah, it's good. It's uh, fun. It means that people, like, well, they can complain, but they complain individually at us as opposed to us as a group, so... I think <laughs> we're... Uh, yeah. man. All right, let's talk about the games we've been playing this week. I don't really need to introduce Matt. This has been on the show quite a few times. He streams with us an awful lot. He also streams with the Scumbag Egg, known as Northern Lion. I don't really stream with the Scumbag Egg anymore, you know? Oh, I ditched okay. him, dis I broke up with him, he's replaced any knowledge me. Of his actions. I got wow. it. Wow. Right. Yeah. Wow. He's too busy. He got, he got good famous. at For Honor, and that was, our, that was the splitting point. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I know how that feels. Like, Sam yeah. won't even talk to me anymore because I'm below his level. Yeah. Terrible, Ryan really. just gets too good. We've tried, we tried to play uh, twos at one point, and I just dragged him down. Yeah, and he just he hated you. I just get no smashed doubt. every time, and then he just get two on one. Uh, well, you definitely. know, like For Honor is definitely the defining game of right now. You know, oh, pretty yes. much everybody that I know is playing it nonstop. Like, no there's doubt. really no. nothing else. <laughs> no. I mean, no. What else could possibly be relevant <laughs> no. at the moment? Yeah. No. Yeah, no, man, I just wish that some more, like, good games would come out. No. Yeah, well, like, we, Ghost Recon came out. Came out. Can, no, can, Ghost can Recon. It's okay, dude, we got Ghost they, Recon now, we're fine. Ubisoft is on a roll. For Honor, uh, Ghost Recon, there's nothing else we need to play. What else could we need? We only need exactly. one games developer and publisher anymore, and that's Ubisoft. They'll give us all we need for the rest of our lives. We get swords, we get guns, we get towers. Well, yeah, man. Yeah, all of those I mean... I would be happy if Ubisoft was the only game developer that existed. Of course, I would. When too. are we getting Raven Rabbids like seven? I, that's out quite soon, isn't it? I thought <laughs> yeah. actually, I think it's on iOS. I think they just you released know, another Raven Rabbids on dance. iOS. Just uh, dance. True enough. See, you even get fitness. You get your fitness routine out of Ubisoft. Right? Ubisoft God. provides everything. 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 <laughs> just Dance Eight. You have to climb a tower in order to unlock more songs. Genius. Great. And you got to do like fitness the climbing motion. Yeah, yeah, totally. Fitness level reached. It's going to be so good. They'll eventually have an alternate reality game, which involves climbing real stairs to unlock oh special bonuses for your Holy life. Holy shit. For your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got, to, you've got to do it sound like a horse as well. For... <laughs> I, don't know, I don't understand Whoa. what's happening all of a sudden. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not really sure either. Uh, look, shall we? Uh, instead of going on to the inevitable Zelda discussion, so we start with Horizon Zero Dawn, which is something. Yo, that, sure. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I know Jess has been playing a lot of Dodger. I'm not sure if you had the opportunity to. I know that. Uh, I haven't, but I can give you Sam uh, Sam's arbitrary number score. Sam can't aim for shit. First by all, the way, hold on. I watched Sam him try and use score? that bow. Oh my god! It was. It was quite the experience. It was like interpretive he, dance, uh, more so than combat. I mean. To be fair, not saying that this would affect his aiming at all, but he beat the game on very hard. Okay, mm. fair. And uh, on stream said, man, I think that game was a 9 out of 10. And then when the stream was done, he looked at me and he goes, it was a 10 out of 10. <laughs> 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 D didn't want to... Uh... We don't want to break his credibility. Way to ruin there. it for him. I'm oh, sorry. No. I'm sorry. He tried to play it cool, but he fucking loves that game. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Dodger, can you take about 10% so. off your levels, please? Just uh, just peeking a little bit there. Uh, everyone's at home today. We're just having a nice chill day. Uh, Dodger just moved to a house. You can check by the boxes in the background there. And Jesse, I don't know what his excuse for not being in the office is, but hey, it's his right. So uh, I'm getting my collector's edition of Nair. Ah, so he's staying home to make sure it doesn't get stolen like everything else that ends up at your problem, and I get it. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's fair. That's that's totally fair. All right, um, Jesse, tell me about Horizon Zero Dawn. You do a big stream of this. You've been doing videos yeah. on it, and uh, apparently Aloy is your new waifu. My new waifu? Love her to death. Uh, yeah, so Aloy, uh, here's, here's what I'll say about this game. Um, I love the setting. I love the character. I love the weird techno future. 
I love uh, how beautiful it looks. I love the weird, strange things that are in this game. But under the surface, if I had to be, like, critical of it, it is essentially third-person Far Cry. I got that feeling from watching it, really. Yeah. Even down to the UI decisions and the little notifications of stuff to pick up and farm and craft and everything. It's like, this seems oddly familiar. That's... Yeah. You can straight up... No, you can straight up buy maps from vendors that show you where stuff is just like Far Cry. Like, yeah. it is so much Far Cry in it. You're just like, okay, I know what this game is, but everything else that... The icing on the cake is so gorgeous, you don't give a fuck. Hmm. Like, Dude, yeah. Every time that I came up to say hi to Sam, I would... It, just no matter what he was doing or where he was in that game, I was like, whoa, that looks beautiful. Like every it single does time. look gorgeous. gorgeous. So on direction gorgeous. wise, holy shit, it is a beautiful game. And yeah. he's not, he was playing it on just a normal PS4, just like yeah. for anybody who's curious. Yeah, like, that's what I played. Gorgeous. That's what I played on too. I have to have a pro. Apparently, mm-hmm. quite surprising. You know, if you view, uh, I mean, uh, obviously, I'll keep making the argument 30 FPS is trash, but y- the thing is, even on a regular PS4, they kept it stable like mm-hmm. it didn't drop at all on either of the systems and the frame pacing is apparently super accurate so the game feels smoother than a lot of these other games that have irregular frame pacing stuff like say final fantasy 15 yeah mm-hmm. that's yeah, the impression I, that i got of it i i i having played i played like five or six hours of it and it I, I agree with everything Jesse said. The problem is I couldn't get past the underlying of like, I've played this game 30 times. Mm-hmm. The world is really interesting and really cool. And the story is awesome. And Aloy is awesome. Like, and the game is yeah. gorgeous and it plays well. But that, that uh, like constant feel of like, I've played this style of game a thousand times, just completely sapped most of my enjoyment. But I can still look at it and be like, I get this game is great. It's just not groundbreaking. It, it's, it's one of those things where, um, you have those moments where, yeah, like a guy's like, I lost my ring. Also, while you're out there, if you could collect me four boar pelts. And it's like, <laughs> okay, I, see how games, I get how games work. But at, the same, but at the same time, there's a moment where this lady's like, I accidentally bumped into a weird door out in the wild. and I don't know what it is. And then like, I ran off because it scared me. And Aloy's like, I'll go look at it because I'm a fucking badass. And when you get inside the, the door, it's a giant underground all mechanical fucking yeah. like super robot structure. And it's like, what the fuck is even happening right now? And it's that, it's that injection of cool shit every so often that keeps it really fun and exciting and keeps you going. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, if I had to be like hypercritical, it is straight up just a, a, a much better version of Far Cry Primal. Like it's just a much yeah. more exciting, interesting version. Um, and it gives you enough lore tidbits to keep you going and pushing you. But at its core, it is, it's nothing revolutionary. Um, it just looks awesome. <coughs> the, uh, like, like you can tell some of the gameplay mechanics are taken from Uncharted. You can tell some of the gameplay mechanics are taken from Far Cry. You can tell some of them are taken... Like, all these different things, you can tell where they were taken from. And I'm okay with it because it's stuff that I love from everything. Because they do um, it exceptionally well. Yeah, like the towers in this game are not towers. They're giant walking brontosaurus robots and you have to climb them as they move, which is fucking dope. So then it unlocks the map area. Yeah. And, right. Uh, I think that's cool as shit. And then uh, it's one of those things where it's a game that at the beginning is very, very, like it hits all the points and all the tropes that you would need for a game like this. <clears throat> and from everything I've seen later on, it gets fucking bonkers. So that is, I'm ready for that. I'm ready for I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard that lore-wise, once you get further in the game, it starts to get crazy in like a right, really right. good way, which sounds awesome to me because the, the setting is already cool, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so. Yeah. And, and, and uh, someone in chat just nailed it as well. The idea that uh, the little like grid system that she activates with the little headpiece that lets her see the world is straight up just witcher senses so they've taken Mm. all these things and just combined them into this game again fine with it i think it's i think it's great but well yeah i mean that would hardly be the first dev to do it blizzard basically made their money on the back of doing that there's nothing wrong with taking parts from other games and refining them and all that sort of thing Uh, i think that the feel that uh, a lot of us are getting though is that we have open world fatigue maybe more so than your average gamer does. Yeah. 
I actually I've taken I, that into account. Yeah, I made a video on this like last year or the year before when you remember when Mad Max came out and it got very mixed reviews. Like some people yeah. really loved it. Yeah. It got some four out of ten. Some people really hated it. And but the overall like user score was really high and it sold very well. And mm -hmm. I was interested to see if there was a disconnection between what critics and YouTubers and streamers want and what the average gamer wants. And there mm -hmm. is, because those games to your average gamer who can't buy or doesn't get all their games for free, obviously, and can't buy like 20, 30 games a month, yeah. are, they're great value for them. Like, and they perceive yeah. them as great value because like, oh, there's a ton of content in this really big open world to explore. And these little side activities that annoy the shit out of us that we view as busy work, they view as content. And they view it as like, hey, I got great value from, for my money from this game as a result. Hey, I view it as content. People get pissed at me when I'm like, <laughs> oh, no, but this guy over here, he just wants me to go, like, kill this one creature. But it's way on this side map, so we got to go do it, though. People are like, <laughs> fucking move on. <laughs> well, I mean, like, no, I for, for, for a video, that is, that's terrible. But you know, for, for gameplay. That's when you just cut out the travel points and editing. No, well, that no, involves I, editing. Not happening. Not <laughs> happening. Get fucked. Get fucked, internet. I'm never going to change. Do you think Jesse has <laughs> ever even installed Adobe Premiere? I Premier? ain't changing now. I uh, doubt it. But yeah, I, it's, it's I think weird, that's, that's why. Yeah, because you like as as you said, we get to play like three or four open big open worlds a game every single year at least, and it takes something really special to change it. You mean this remember, month? This year? month? Yeah, well, this yeah. Month, yeah. Well, this month is crazy. We're but like, I remember playing uh, Shadow of Mordor, and that game did everything by the book. It was the same thing, but the, the, nemesis, system, the nemesis system. Yeah, the nemesis system was like enough to be like, yes, I'm in. Because that, that's what pushed cool. it over the edge for me, definitely. Because if, if that hadn't been in there, it's like, well, this is um, Arkham of Mordor. Is yeah, what this exactly. is like the, even down with the fighting system and everything else. I, I was glad that I got into the Nemesis system quickly and that the Nemesis system gave me the results that it did. Because for some people, they never got the really cool experiences that the Nemesis system provided. Right. Yeah. So they so they ended up seeing the game in a much different light and viewing it as a much more poor experience, which is a risk when some of your content is kind of emergent and is sort yeah. of reliant on what the player does and these unique circumstances. To me, that's amazing and really a great example of what games can do that any other media can't do, allowing you to tell your own story. But it's still a risk because for some people, they're not going to get that story and they're going to view the game right. as much weaker as a result of that. Actually, I want to hold on to that no. idea and bring it to Zelda when we go there. Uh, sure. I was about to yeah. say, it's the very Zelda thing, I think. Yeah, yeah I want to talk about that. Totally. We'll get, but, into um, that. we'll get into that soon enough. Uh, Dodger, you had something to add to that? Oh, I, I was just going to say, like, isn't that the best way to try and do something like that, though? To to try and create a new system or, like, a completely different aspect to the game, but then pull from, like, when you're developing the rest of the game, pull from people who did it right. I agree. Yeah. I yeah. Think you know, it, it's, to it's, make sure that the rest of the game is at least, you know, as enjoyable as other games that are in that same genre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think at this point, it like true innovation in the way that like someone invents a brand new genre is almost non-existent. Like it, it never happens anymore. We've got so many video games that almost every idea has been tried. Maybe good, maybe not so good. The stuff that mm -hmm. was good generally is integrated into genres. That's why it's dumb. It, 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 people keep bringing up, it was like, oh, is it this clone or that clone? It's like, well, if we go back to the term Doom clone, when yeah. FPS was still being developed, the fact yeah. of the matter is FPS became a genre and became as successful as it did because a bunch of other people took what was good out of Doom and then tried different things with the formula. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. And now right. we have first-person shooter as a genre. And that's how genres are created. So, yeah, I think that is the way... To, to me, that's the way to go. You've Especially with a game that's expensive and as complicated as an open-world game, you can't rethink everything. Agreed. Here's a question for you, Jesse. Does Horizon just throw the story out of the window for a moment? I know that's yeah. good, that that will make you cringe because you know you big into that sort of thing. I get that. Throw yeah. it out the window for a second. View it as a completely mechanical experience. Is there a standout system or element to that game that is innovative or straight up like different to every other open world game that you've played? Uh, my favorite. In, 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 there's a few, but I think the biggest standout game uh, standout in the game is the fact that you as a character can uh, use something you get very early on to hack all the things that exist in this world. So you unlock the ability to hack everything over time, but you can straight up, except for corrupted robots, you can hack everything. And they all do different things. So some you can ride, some will be like a pet kind of that attacks shit for you. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's really, really cool 
that this is now uh uh Actually, now that I think about it, which is crazy, it's also very much like Far Cry Primal and that you could get animals to do shit for and, you there. And like Shadow <laughs> of Mordor, where you could yeah, yeah, tame yeah, yeah, yeah. slave orcs. And, it's, yeah. a, it's an advancement on that system, right? Because you're talking I about being able to right, hack yeah. everything. It's, like, it's whereas in other open world games, it's been, it's been more limited in what you could do in that respect. Yeah. Um, I, I, I like the... I think the, the use of uh, your headset to find certain points in the world um that show you the past i think it's kind of a neat idea so you see all these ruins then you're automatically you see what it looked like in the past that's how i found out the game where the game takes place i'm not gonna spoil that never mind but like um I, there's a lot of cool things but at the end of the day i, I think this might be the uh, it's a weird thing to say the most blizzard of uh oh, like open world open world games yeah and that it, everything is taken from somewhere else and fits together so perfectly it's a different that, recipe with the same ingredients refined yeah and, and i think what's neat is that you can see all the other devs where they see their game thing put in this game are really receptive to it I, sure. if, yeah. if you follow the cd project and the gorilla guys their back and forth is really cute it's so cute yeah <laughs> they keep sending each other pictures of uh Geralt and aloy like hunting together and doing, it's like oh that's awesome. love it. it's i love cd yeah. project red they're so good they're so awesome yeah and i, I think know. this is this yeah i the more i think about it everything that i love is things that i love from another game uh -huh. as well which is fine because that sells mm -hmm. copies i mean hell it's what Overwatch sold a lot on the back of as well. There's all you'll yeah. find familiar elements all over the place in Overwatch, just combined in a different way, and mm. that's what a lot of games are. You know, it's just it's the same as cooking. You know, just because one game uses particular ingredient doesn't mean that everything else can't. And you can combine them in different ways, in different amounts, in different orders, cook them in different ways to make different things, mm -hmm. and that's just the way that it is. The problem for me is that I've played so many open world games at this point that I'm completely fatigued by right. that kind of game. And if I want to play an open world game, I'm going to have to play something where I either really fucking care about the world, which probably is going to be Mass Effect this month, or that has some brand new system in it that I've never seen before that changes the experience for me on a fundamental level. Right. This is, this is going to sound really stupid, but hopefully this makes sense. In my mind, it's genius, but it's going to sound stupid. I can't wait. Um, this game is like uh, pizza. If you think of games as pizza... This game is a, everyone's had pizza before. This is just a, it's a similar thing to what you've had, but it's delicious. Like it's a fucking well-crafted pizza that is super good. But sometimes you're like, I just don't want fucking pizza right now. Mm -hmm. And, and you can understand where that comes from. <clears throat> but it, you know, everyone's had pizza and everyone's experienced pizza before. This is just a very, very, very fucking good pizza. Right. But at the end of the day, not everyone wants a fucking pizza. And so that's kind of where I'm at with this game. I yeah. think, it's, I think that that's a good metaphor. Yeah, I, I think yeah. it's amazing. I think it's an amazing game. But yeah, the more I think about it, I'm like, no, that's from something else. No, that thing I love is from something else. <laughs> like, but I'm really hypercritical of the game. I'm like, it's really all taken from other places, but fuck it, it's super fun. So I don't even care. But they put, their, they put their like, you know, post-apocalyptic high technology spin on it. And that's kind of cool just to even see. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a new, I think the setting is is the real the real yeah. star of the show. It's something brand new that that at least in the video game space, it's not a new concept of like the post 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 apocalypse. But the idea that that they're giving us something like this is kind of neat, and it's an open world thing. And you know, shout out to them for being creative and having some fun. So yeah, sure. yeah. All right. Well, if we're going to be talking about open world, we might as well get onto Zelda. That's that's definitely. Yeah. Kind of relevant at the moment, so I've been told a few yeah, a people have been bit. playing this. Although, uh, it was outsold I'll, in the UK by Horizon, which some people were shocked by, and then, I'm not. of course, I'm I. because there's a massive install base of PS4 users and the Switch just came out, of course it was outsold. So, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Not, uh, not a big surprise. I think, I think everything we just said about Horizon also, I think, applies to Zelda. Yeah, I'm going to be like completely contrarian to my own self and be like, while Horizon didn't hook me, Zelda has hooked me. And uh, I spent hours thinking about, like, why is Zelda any different? I mean, to, if we're going to get right into it, I, not to, like, fire shots at our friends or anything, but I don't think Zelda is a 10 out of 10. Like, mm -hmm. I really think, like, Zelda goggles are on these reviewers, and they're oh, just, like, they're, I... they're wanking the Zelda wang, and they're just, like, Zelda, 10 out of 10. And they're, like, 
you know, Zelda gets a lot of undeserved perfect scores, but this time we mean it. And I'm like, <laughs> really? No. I, I'll say, I mean, I'll say this. I think that any org that gives a 10 out of 10 to Zelda, considering its performance issues alone, is out of their minds. Yeah. Like, that is not a irrelevant thing. It reminds me of uh, when... I think it was some uh, one of the Rooster Teeth shows. I don't want to like blast the entirety of Rooster Teeth. It was just a couple of people that Rooster Teeth took the piss out of Jeff Gerstmann because he rated Fallout 4 low because it ran like shit on launch. <laughs> and people were like, oh, how dare you? As they wear their collector's edition Pip-Boys. And it's like, what are you right, talking yeah. about? I, I, I think that uh, so many reviewers completely gloss over performance as if... They it Listen. doesn't matter. It's like, it fucking does. It impedes your ability to play the game. It's not, uh, graphics. Graphics is what reading, I hear all the time. No, that's reviews, what it is. It's more than just that. That They gloss over a lot. That's that's the thing. It's like, Zelda is beautiful. It <laughs> it plays, all, like, the, the concepts in this game are fucking dope. The puzzles, like, it's yeah. everything you want in a Zelda. I get that you're excited there's a new Zelda, but under the surface, there's, a, there's problems this game. <laughs> And there's a lot of problems. It, yeah, Absolutely. yeah. So as a, yeah, I, again, I'm reading the reviews. I, other than the so I'm playing on the Switch, and I played it. I've played it a decent amount on my TV and as portable. Uh, performance wise, when it's portable, I've had no frame drops whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It's smooth as hell. And that's what I'm that's playing. The only that's the way that I've played it. So that's <laughs> actually, and that, the thing is, that's actually true as well. They did a frame rate test. The it does run better in portable mode than it does yep. in docked mode, and you might think that's insane. How could that be possibly the case? Well, it's because it's 900p versus 720p. Yeah. 720p is a fuckload less pixels. It, it's less to yeah. render. So mm -hmm. yeah, it it does run better because it's rendering lower, which is why it's dumb as fuck. By the way, that they don't just give you the option to play in 720p in docked mode because then you'd have a smoother experience. Yeah, it's I would true. love to have that option. Yeah, because uh, when I do play it on my TV, it happens often enough probably once every 10 five or 10 minutes i get like a big chug yes uh, mm. depends it, on the it, area and things like yeah, that. yeah it really does depend on the area Man, um that sucks yeah it's it's pretty rough it's apparently it's it's a million times better than the wii u version though i hear the wii u version is like part of the wii u version has some issues yeah pretty bad yeah um, with, with fps dropping but to, to focus on the gameplay a little bit uh, again, it's, it's an open world game that's actually hooked me pretty hard since like The Witcher 3. And I love The Witcher 3. Um, but I think about, oh, Jesus. You're Keep right. Going. You're yeah, right. Keep going. Has, uh, yep, has that game? How's that video game? <laughs> is that the Nintendo rep that sits under your desk making sure you know, don't right? say anything bad? Shut your mouth. Is, you say you, you love it. it. You say you love it. You're a <laughs> <That's> uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> so gameplay wise, there's a lot of things that I don't like about the game. One, I hate the weapon degradation system. I think it's oh my god, garbage. Me too. And like, I, I, like part of me gets it. I get that. Like, eventually, you probably find the master sword, and that one doesn't ever break because it's the sword that's supposed right. to like destroy the darkness or whatever the fuck. But I'm like, god damn Man, it! Wouldn't it suck if it did? Well, yeah. here's here's the thing: is that every person that I know who argues for this system is like, but it's more realistic. And I'm like, it is not realistic. No, for no, I after will never take more five realistic. Times. No. no. In a game never. where you could pop out a glider literally anywhere and fly, more realistic. In, in a, a game where, where you could summon a horse exist. out of nowhere, more like, realistic. Jesus. Bomb arrows, more realistic. Yeah, please go on. In, in other, that's like, again, in, in the reviews I was reading, they they like praising the system. And I'm like, why? What? It's awful. Give me, give me a reason as to how that enhances the game. I don't you dare say more realistic is bullshit. It's a bullshit, cliche, vague, vapid term that some reviewers use to try and vaguely justify a point when they don't actually have a real explanation as to why the system is good. If it's any, not good. If anything, it exists in games, especially in this one, to create a like a false increase in difficulty when it's an already difficult game. Okay. Like it's the idea that. I don't want to use my good weapons because they're going to break. Yep. And I don't want to fight things because shit's going to break. So you're trying to avoid stuff and, and sneak around stuff and using lesser shit because you don't want to ruin your good shit because you want to save that for like a boss fight or something. What that I will say is... It drives me I, crazy. I feel like the game does a good job of encouraging me to, use, to like swap 
weapons. That seems I'm, like part of the purpose, right? I'm I'm I, the sort of player where like if I'm if I'm playing a game where I have a bunch of different types of guns, right? I'll just stick with one gun until I'm out of ammo and then be like, well fuck, the I have The one that works the best. Out. You'll pick yeah. the, the optimal one, right? So I, I actually kind of like that in Zelda, they're like, okay, every you'll find axes, you'll find hammers, and there are some things you can only do with axes, there are some things you can only do with hammers, and it like encourages you to think about the fact that you should be swapping between things. It's kind of forced I, diversity, really. I think there's, there's better way, because that's a that's a stick approach where a carrot, I think, would work better. Yeah, well, You that, can encourage that, people that, to use different it weapons to get rewards leads into for some, it. Yeah. One of my other issues with Zelda is that the sense of progression feels lacking. Like I feel like none. So one of the cool things about Zelda is obviously exploring and finding ruins and like looking at the stuff. But I never get like amazingly excited about anything I find because I'm like, oh, this ruin, what's it gonna have? It has a chest with a gemstone in it and like a weapon that I can use for one encounter and then it'll break. And I'm oh, like, sick. I got some amber. There's no. Yeah, exactly. There's no like. I love exploring the landscape is gorgeous. It looks like a Studio Ghibli like movie. Yeah, but it's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful game. None of the finds feel extraordinary where, and I, I think about the open world game I keep going back to, which is The Witcher, where that game encourages weapon swapping often. And they let you find like these little areas that tell their own story without needing a quest for it. And you can get gear that you just replace your weapon with. So instead of giving me broken weapons, let me find a weapon, use it, and then find a better one later on and I can just ditch and just sell the other one. The, the degradation system in The Witcher 3 was fucking garbage too and I hated it as well. But at least your weapons were still usable even when they were broken. Um, I, 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 this is the one thing I think you're, you're really right on in that most of the exploration, uh, the reward comes from Getting nostalgia. There. Yes. It, it's the idea like, oh, I found the Temple of Time. Well, that That's sure sounds cool. like Nintendo. <laughs> and it, it, yeah, it, it, and it results from like, oh, I know exactly what this place is. Interesting. I wonder how this relates to this version of Zelda. It's, it's that kind of thing, which in, in itself is awesome. Like, it's cool, but that's at its core what it is. It's like, it, oh, I'm a fan of Zelda and I know what this is. So that's why I'm excited to see this. And people are saying you do get better weapons. Yeah, but they still fucking break. None of them feel special. Like you get this weapon, you're like, oh cool, this is doing 10 more damage. I'm in a harder zone, but I'm not gonna be keeping this for more than 10 minutes until it breaks, or it's so good, I'm gonna stash it for so long, I'm never gonna fucking use it. That's what I was saying. Yeah, right. you find a weapon that's really good and you're like, well, I can't use this now because yeah. if I do, it's gonna break. So I gotta save it for like a boss. But it's like, what's the point of having that cool weapon then? <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. It's in your fucking bag, you don't get to use it and see I, it. I feel like Dodge is trying to get in here to defend. Sorry, sorry. I wanna hear the other point of view. Oh, I got distracted by the fact that Krender just got... <laughs> I, I, I timed him out in chat. He, deser he <laughs> totally deserved it. He needs to learn there are consequences to his actions. Um, <laughs> like, if, if I were going to say that there was something... Because, honestly, I, I really like this game. Me um, too. I, I think that it's just just yep. to establish since we're like shitting on it about no, no, yeah, like, like, like everyone think, here likes this game. Please yeah, don't get it twisted. Except, well, I mean, I don't because I haven't played it. And it runs at thirty. I'd never play a thirty FPS game because I'm not dirty like that. <gasps> three out of four. We're like we're like more like more like, like dirty <laughs> FPS. Am I right? Dirt, Honestly, dirty, like, filthy FPS. I I think that the game is really peaceful to play. Um, yes. It's it's different from from other open world games that I've played recently because it just feels like I can kind of relax and play it. Um, the world feels very serene, and yeah, there is that nostalgic element of like, oh my gosh, like you know, oh I'm in Kakariko Village, right? Like that kind of a thing where yeah. you're just enjoying that element. Right. The thing that honestly bothers me the most is that every one of those little trial temples has the exact same like skin set i guess i don't know how to how to put they all look the yeah. same um and it it bothered me when i when i saw that like all of the monks inside of them were identical at first i was like man all of the monks look identical but maybe eventually like when you go to other areas they look different and so far every single one of those temples you go into like the tiles are the same the monks are the same and i'm like Really? <laughs> what have changed at all? Like, Hyrule's a big place. Like, there are no changes? And again, I've only played, you know, like, six or seven hours of the game. But, like... I have the, I have the exact same thought. And in my, my reasoning for getting past it was, this is 
some big story thing that need like just like all the ruins you see like oh well there's the ancient shit here that doesn't make sense to me yet that maybe all this will come together like mm-hmm. maybe underneath all the earth there's all the like it's all connected and like there's an under like i'm i'm just yeah because you have to have some some justification for some of this stuff where i'm just like maybe there's a reason and not just they're like fuck it everything's gonna look the same <laughs> i was like maybe that's like the culture i don't know so yeah um Fuck, there was another thing I wanted to talk about too that I didn't like. Oh, another thing that I think is garbage is the inventory system. It's fucking shit. If you're going to make me like go through weapons and they're going to break, give me a big inventory. Don't give me a shit inventory that you're going to force me to upgrade through collectibles and finding this man with maracas who's going to shake them at me. Every Mathis, time I, I, I got to be honest. The, the reasoning that you're giving for why your inventory should be bigger sounds like you're arguing the opposite. <laughs> My weapons are breaking all the time. I need lots of inventory. <laughs> yeah, because I need a ton of weapons because they're constantly giving me weapons. It's not even like it's a, like a big deal. It's that I'm so sick of, if I'm going to find a weapon. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Let me pick it up. And then it's like, your inventory is full. Click, go into menu, go to your inventory, inventory find a weapon, management is drop it, a fun pick thing. it up. Boom. Yeah. It is, it's, it's a long, tedious process to to uh to get a new weapon and sure you can upgrade your inventory but even that's a pain in the ass uh to just do i just wish if you're gonna make me take a bunch of weapons let me just have a bunch of weapons don't limit me and then force me to upgrade later on i think the inventory system is a little sloppy personally (laughs) it it can be difficult to manage you know i think that uh developers have to realize that inventory management is not an enjoyable process for pretty much anybody it's very hard to make it enjoyable it's a necessary evil as it were so you want to try and minimize the amount of it that's done and there's definitely been games where i have just been infuriated by the amount of inventory management due to a lack of space or whatever especially early on in the game that's made the whole thing a a giant pain in the ass the weapon system just sounds a little odd and contrived to me i I think back to games that have used that such as dead rising and how much how much it made sense within the world the fact that you were in a shopping mall and you're having to use anything around you to escape the zombies and all that sort of thing and eventually you would find decent weapons by looking for them and then you'd be able to collect books to uh make sure that they didn't break as often and get skills in order to uh, learn to make sure that they were better and all that sort of thing doing that in zelda is a is odd to me because it seems like uh, people are making the argument that oh it makes it means you've got to improvise yeah but are these weapons improvised weapons or are they because some, some, some are, are yeah because yeah, it you sounds some, to me a lot of them are like rake. it's like oh this is uh this is a hammer this is a mace this is a bow and arrow it's like no these aren't improvised these are real weapons uh, uh, so, some things are literally you walk under a tree and you find a branch and you can equip that as a melee weapon sure, that's cool mm-hmm. But overall, like I said, I do love the game. Like I'm, I'm still playing it on my off time, which I don't really do uh, with open world games. And I was trying to think about why. It's honestly a removal of something that other open world games have so often. And it goes back to the tower thing, uh, where in other open world games, you climb a tower, it reveals the map, and it peppers that map with all these little things you can go and do. And for me, internally, it turns an open world into a hub world with a checklist of chores to accomplish. And it, it kind of like bogs me down where in Zelda, you'll climb a tower, it'll reveal the map, but only the topography, and it won't tell you where anything is. And if you want to find something, you have to go out and find it yourself. And it makes the world feel, it makes exploring and everything feel more natural and more realistic, I guess, and way more fun. So when you do stumble across, say, some civilian fighting off a monster calling for help, it's not because you saw it on the map and said, person needs help, go get, go help this person. And it's because you were wandering and all of a sudden, oh my God, this person's fighting a monster. I'm the hero. Let me go save them. And yeah. just a removal of one little feature like that from other open world games infinitely made it more fun for me to go out into the world and look around. Mm-hmm. That's I, cool. I, that reminds me of experiences I had with Red Dead Redemption, actually, where I'd stumble across yes. things. And uh, and the, the in the last few years, maps for open world games have become unreadable because they're just covered in highlights and waypoints and landmarks and it's like, wow, there's just icons everywhere. Remember that fucking Assassin's Creed Unity map that people posted when it first came out where you couldn't even see the layout of the level because it was just so covered in shit? It was, <laughs> yeah. that, that is, there, there's another element of open world fatigue to me. I'm sick of that sort of thing. I like that you get to customize the map how you want to. Um, that you can like ping certain areas and you can put like little stickers down on the map and be yeah. like, this is where a cooking pot is. This is where apple trees are. Like That's cool. whatever you think is important enough to remember where it is that it gives you lots of little symbols that you can use on the map yourself it doesn't like 
force you to have those, which is cool. Yeah, it it's a complete like true reverse. open world exploration as opposed to what we get with a lot of open world games. It's like you're not exploring anything because the game's going to tell you exactly where everything fucking is and it's yes. going to give you a giant map with everything yeah. on it. And the only thing it's really going to do is maybe restrict parts of those maps until you get up a tower or something. Yeah, yeah. I, I, let me just say, I'm not, I might, I'm not sure what the internet, what the world thinks of this. I fucking love the weather system. I, I too. love it too. And you can get cold and you get hot and you can like, I love everything about it. I love that it makes it feel more real than like in, in Horizon, for example, you're running from a cold weather zone to a hot weather zone. So you're like, there's palm trees and you're, no matter what, you're in whatever <laughs> like, outfit you have. You're like, fuck like, it, wow, I'm Aloy and I'm awesome. <laughs> it's amazing yeah. that the weather here is 20 degrees warmer than it was three feet that way. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and Link is like, fuck it. No, I'm up in a I'm mountain freezing. now and I'm freezing my ass off. <laughs> yeah. Or I'm in the middle of a volcano and like this shit's hot as hell and I could pass out. Like, I think that's yeah. awesome. I think that's really, really cool. It's great. Yeah. And that's like going back to the whole icon system. Like I've specifically started marking where peppers are because of that. So yeah. that I could be like, okay, I need to go into a cold area. I don't have cold clothes yet because I haven't been in like that sort of a zone with a city where I can buy those clothes. So mm -hmm. I'm going to make a bunch of pepper like meals for myself because those give me a stat boost, you know, like that kind of a thing. And by the cool. way, I love the cooking song. It's. <laughs> I, here's the question. Here's the question, Dodger. I'm gonna like. Uh, I'm gonna break your heart here. You're gonna have to choose between okay. between these two: the cooking okay. song for Zelda versus the barbecue song for and, Monster Hunter. Oh uh, yeah, or or the the cafe song for Monster Hunter oh. with the, the cat cafe song where they're making you uh, food. Oh, I forgot that the cats make you food too. Yeah, where you, where you, where you bang, you're dancing and you're banging your things <laughs> on the table. Um, you know, I, I feel like because with the Monster Hunter one, you you got to be part of the action, you know, because you There's had to like game, time yeah. it out perfectly mm -hmm. to make sure you didn't burn the food. Zelda doesn't make you do that. So I, I would say the Monster Hunter one has a, a little bit of a, a bump. Yes. So <laughs> take that, there's people also, that gave the game the cats, 10 out of 10. But... You claimed the game was perfect. We've just proven scientifically that it's not. So screw uh, you. Uh, uh, wow. <laughs> it's, a 10, it's a 10 out of 10. It's a 10 out of 10. 10 out of 11. See, we put it's... probably up to 11 right across the board. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why didn't you just take 10 and make that better? Uh, these go 11. Oh, it's, it's still... um. Zelda's still very Nintendo. People are saying it's very hard, and it is actually a very, it's actually very difficult. The, the environmental well, Nintendo hazards games alone. are quite hard. Like, I don't know if people, it's people seem to have yeah. forgotten, but yeah. yeah, Nintendo actually makes some difficult games sometimes. I was, I was on the you top of You die a lot in yeah. Zelda. In the, in the tutorial zone, I die like five times. Like, I got my ass kicked. The game doesn't tell you much. I was on top of a mountain at one point, and a ram rammed me, and I fell off the mountain, and it was like, dush, 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 dead. And I was like, all right, well. I didn't realize. <laughs> I didn't realize that, like, if I was climbing a mountain and my stamina ran out, oh, I, thought I, was gonna, I thought I was going to, well, I thought I was going to drop, but drop straight down. So I was like, well, if I ran out of stamina, at least, like, I know I'll drop onto the highest ledge that I had gotten to. No, no, no. You fall, like, like here's boing, the boing, map. Boing, boing. You're, like, up here, and you fall like this. <laughs> yeah, Link, it. like, throws himself. He's <laughs> like, fuck it. I'm done. <laughs> I'm, I'm dead. If I'm going out, I'm going out in style. <laughs> <laughs> but... It's, 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 Zelda's difficult, but it's not punishing in that there's auto saves all over the place. So yeah. right. it encourages like, go explore, go get fucked up. But if you die, don't worry, you'll be just a little bit back to where you were. There's yeah. not a lot of punishment for dying, which is nice because the game sure. does, it just wants you to go and explore, man. And it, it is a lot of fun to explore. Yeah, you don't, you don't want people being scared of doing that. Uh, exactly. Not, it's, not, it's not Dark Souls. Creeping very slowly across the map, being careful of everything around everything. You can do turn. that, though. That's an option. Yeah. And you can sneak up on dudes and kill them. And I think that is yep, super That's cool, fun. too. But it's not a 10 out of 10, is my point. I think it's a very good game. But I think people who review Zelda need to wait like a month and a half before they're allowed to give a score. <laughs> like, yeah, no shit. Let it sink in that okay, yeah. it was a Zelda game. Got a little bit of perspective great. on it. Yeah. It's this like, game does it's like banging me. and then immediately being like, I love you. It's like, well, you maybe should wait. <laughs> you sh you shouldn't do that? <laughs> <laughs> Not right oh, away. Fuck. <laughs> okay. Damn. I know. Um, well, it's the last time game... I say I love you, Mathis. 
What? You know how, like, uh, with Persona 4, I think TB and I talked about this when both of us were playing Persona 4 Golden, that, like, we both had this feeling of every time, you know, you go to bed, you feel like you could just sit there and play it for a couple of hours. And, and be I like, did. It completely good. fucked up sleep. my sleep schedule for, like, a month. Yeah, and that's that's exactly what I did, too. I feel like Breath of the Wild will be that for me, where mm-hmm. I'm, like, I go to bed, and I'm like, I'm going to play a little Breath of the Wild, and then, all right, bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> Such as the the dangers of portable. Let us be All thankful. Right. Let us pray to, pray to thankful to the gods that Persona Five is not a portable game. Otherwise, sleep would be lost and it would be terrible. Yeah, uh, I can't wait for Persona Five. You, can, you mean you can't wait for the next delay for Persona Five? Don't fucking say that. <laughs> why? Why are you doing that? <laughs> I'm just a realist. I'm a pragmatic realist, is what I am. I, I'm, idealism died within me a long time ago, and for good reason. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no matter what, Breath of the Wild's going to be a big contender for Game of the Year for a lot of people. So I am intrigued. It doesn't to matter see... how much we we talk about the things that are wrong with it. It's still such a huge game, and so many people are in love with it. There's no way that it'll this year will end with it not being in the top five, at least. Yeah. So, I feel like it's getting a lot wanna, of credit. Sorry, go ahead. I want to see how how much reflection is done on it. Like, you know, mm-hmm. after a few, it's not going to be more than a few months, you know, after about nine months, do people still feel the same? I'll yeah. be intrigued. I feel like it's also getting a lot of bonus points because it's Nintendo finally trying to do something different after like years of them being stick in the muds and being like mm-hmm. motion controls and that's it. Yeah. Sure, that's fair. Uh, I don't know, think you should necessarily reward companies for doing what they should be doing. Exactly, with, that's but... what I'm saying. Like, I don't, I don't agree. Like, they're like Nintendo finally revitalizes Zelda. I'm like, they should have been doing that. It's like, is it? it have Fucking they? Forever, it's not about but... have they revitalized Zelda? Have they revitalized, you know, the sort of open world action genre with this game? As if they have, then great. You know, yeah. they probably deserve all the praise they're getting. If they, if not, I, and the whole idea of oh, they revitalize Zelda. It's like I'm sorry, which Zelda have you been playing over the last ten years? Like right. every single Zelda they release has massive changes to the formula. Like I, I don't even game, play Zelda when I know that. If if this game encourages other open world games to remove the the climate tower and now your map is filled with icons and that's it, it's that all would does, be lovely. I'd I would be, be, be okay super with that. happy. Yeah, I I would too. Let's. Uh, People will make the argument, oh, well, you can turn that UI helper off. But the problem is those games were built around having it on. Yeah. So the maps were never designed for you to explore organically. They were designed for you to go in certain directions based on arrows pointing the way you were supposed to go. Yep. And it makes things super hard to find otherwise. So if they do design a game without that from the ground up, it will end up being a much better exploration experience. I agree. Cool. Yeah, go sounds play good. Zelda. Apparently go play Zelda, yeah. Uh, supposedly, <laughs> as the Switch is available to buy in stores in my town right now. Like nobody gives a fuck. So I could just go and buy one right now. But there's yeah. a re- well, there's a reason I'm not. Uh, there's actually quite a few reasons I'm not. There's a lot of stuff we're going to be getting on the news section. Various problems with the hardware and issues that the machine has, and a lot of accusations that the machine was rushed to market. And <laughs> decent amount of evidence to suggest that that is true. We'll talk about that in the news section later on the show. However, in the meantime, we would like to do a few minutes. Of literary promotion. In the for- <gasps> yes, quite. Mm, in the form of audible.com slash cynical is the place to go. Our sponsor today is Audible, an Amazon company. Audible.com slash cynical is the place to go for your free trial and free audiobook. Head on over there to get access to the world's largest library of incredible audiobooks read by professional narrators. We have a few recommendations for you, and the one up on the screen right now is... Dodger's recommendation for the month. <gasps> yeah, it's uh, Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman. And it's awesome because he's the one reading it. And it's just like Norse Mythology as he understands it. He fully admits when like there's something that isn't completely clear, you know, where it's like, we don't know, like, has Ragnarok happened? Is Ragnarok supposed to happen? And it's not super clear, like that kind of stuff. Um, he just, the way that he writes just, is so bright and awesome and just brings things to life and hearing him talk about these gods and be like, yeah, you know, they they didn't necessarily like their gods. Their gods are kind of assholes, but like 
they were scared of their gods because they were fascinating and interesting and powerful. And, you know, here's all of the reasons why. And here are the stories. And here are some of the gods that nobody ever really talks about. And I don't know why. And, like, it's really, really cool. It makes a lot of sense considering that he's based a lot of his fiction on Norse mythology and a couple of other mythologies yeah. as well. And what, I was actually going to recommend American Gods by the same author. <laughs> and there's That's an, an awesome awful book. lot of that in there too. A huge amount of the idea of what, what if these mythological beasts and creatures and beings were real and living in modern times in some respect? Yeah. What would they be doing? All that sort of thing. Neil Gaiman makes some incredible stuff in that respect. Uh, this, because I'm not hugely familiar with his work, like I've got a bit into American Gods and I'm having, I wouldn't say hard hard going, it's just I'm having to re-listen to a few parts of it because there's a lot to take in. I wonder yeah. if listening to this first would actually be helpful. He has very uh, flowery prose. Mm -hmm. he, he adds a lot of like descriptors in there, which I think is one of the reasons why it's really nice listening to him read it. Because you're, you're like, oh, yeah, okay. Like, this is how you intended for this to sound. Yes. You know, and it, it, That's helpful. it winds up coming across really well. Very cool. Norse Mythology, check that out on Audible. You can grab it as your free book if you so desire over at audible.com slash cynical. Yeah. Or maybe you could take Jesse's choice. The master of Star Wars has another suggestion for you. Hey, it's that time where I tell you to buy another Star Wars book. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> this time, it's the conclusion to the Aftermath trilogy. Uh, Nora Wexley and her team are back, and it is super uh, awesome this time. And uh, all I'll say is, everything about this book is everything I ever wanted in Star Wars. It's super good, and there's a lot of stuff in here that I'm like, oh, fuck. Also, it reveals the fate of Jar Jar Binks. So, wink, no spoilers. More uh, like the this, ultimate Sith Lord, am I right? Uh, total Sith Lord. No it doubt. is legit, like, here's what I'll say. The first Aftermath book, I truly did not like. And the second one, I was like, well, this is refreshing. And this one I'm in love with. So uh, I will simply say that uh, shout out to Chuck Wendig for nailing it. And Mark Thompson for being the best uh, audiobook reader ever to exist. For ever. Star Wars, I will so agree. 100% agree. I've listened to six of his Star Wars narrated books so far. And they're all great. Absolutely phenomenal. He does yeah. the voices like no one else. It's crazy. He nails everyone. And yeah. he, he doesn't try to do like, I'm Princess Leia. He nails Leia. everyone. He nails everyone. <laughs> it's, it's so good. Nail everyone. So Indeed. I will simply say that uh, this book is great. And if you ever wanted to know what happens immediately after uh, Return of the Jedi, this is the trilogy for you. It's all canon now. Indeed it is. This is about the time of the show where I recommend my non-fictional fictional book in the form of a, another wrestling book. That's <laughs> This one being the best in the world at what I have no idea, which is Chris Jericho's third book. Yes, he actually has done three of them. This is the first one that he's got an audiobook for. He does not narrate it, but the guy that narrates it sounds suspiciously like him, so I guess it's okay. And it's, it is a biography for all intents and purposes. It's a ton of very funny anecdotes, a lot of crazy stories, and charting a part of his life where he's quite a bit older, he's trying to branch out into other things such as, you know, Hollywood and television, and he's touring with his band Fozzy, and awesome he tells name. stories about uh, being in Iraq at one point in the middle of a war zone because they went there for the Tribute to the Troop show that they do every year where uh, they do shows at... American army bases, they ended up at a remote outpost surrounded by a gang of rabid dogs. And they and he tells the story of having to very quickly evacuate and the smoke grenades going off because there were potentially rocket launchers being aimed at them as they were evacuating via helicopter. And he tells the story of uh, getting into a fight with a Arabian prince in Dubai and all this sort of thing. <laughs> It's like that this, sounds right. This one person should Who not have WWE when you're living this crazy of a life. And it's hard to know what he's exaggerating because, again, it's WWE. That's all fictional. But the crossover between reality and fiction with that company is uniquely weird. And <laughs> it's very hard to say just which of these stories is true and which is not. And I choose to right. believe that they're all true because mm -hmm. that's more exciting that way. Very entertaining. <laughs> Even for people who are not into wrestling, there's no real wrestling jargon going on. It's mostly about his life and the opportunities that he was involved in. I mean, there's a whole chapter on him, both uh, in dance, uh, Dancing with the Stars, which he was on a couple of years ago, 
and talking about that and his dancing teacher and all that sort of thing. There's, it's just a very, he's just a very interesting guy with a lot of really cool stories. So I enjoyed listening to that very much indeed. You can pick them all up over at audible.com slash cynical. Grab your free audiobook, and our sponsor today is, of course, Audible, an Amazon company with an unrivaled library of audiobooks, as well as plays, short stories, podcasts, news, and all manner of other things. Head on over there and check it out. Thank you for sponsoring the show. We will be right back after the break, folks, with more Corruptional Podcasts, more video game discussion. Do not go anywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Corruptional Podcast. Hopefully you had a wonderful break. The sounds of the Guilty Gear soundtrack keeps coming back. Uh, I can't get tired of it. Soundtrack, yeah. Daisuke Ashawaratari, or something along those lines. Is yep. the <laughs> yep. composer. Ashawaratari. Ashawaratari, yeah, who's apparently, <laughs> so apparently <laughs> become so uh, He's a spicy meatball, uh, quite lately. No, that's oh not how you God. pronounce that. <sighs> Guys, um, our movers were Russian and Ukrainian, and I kept doing my fake Russian accent around them out of habit. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> they thought it was hilarious, thank God. <laughs> Like, no, why do I do that? Why do I default into that terrible accent? <laughs> I want to know, yeah. Why did your brain just be like, Russian accent, do it? Uh, I mean, it's kind of my go-to when I'm acting silly. Okay. So when we were all like packing stuff up and putting it on the truck, I would be like, I can't even do it now because all I can think in my head is, it's so good. Just stop. It's so good. That's all I can hear in my head now, so I can't replicate it. It's so good. His accent is so good. And then Sam kept trying to get me to say Ukrainian things to the Ukrainian guy. And I was like, no. <laughs> that would be weird. That would be really terrible. Let's not do any of those things. Yeah. All right, back to uh, video Can I talk games. about Hollow Knight? Uh, you can, if you knock another 10% off your mic. Hollow, then you're allowed to. Hollow another, Knight? Another 10%? Yeah, you're getting a little loud again. I don't know why. It's, it's that giant blue Yeti thing. Can't control it. It does what it wants, when it wants. Hollow. Right. We're down to 70. We're down to 70, boys. Right. Okay, hopefully that that'll better? be fine. Yeah, it sounds better on this end. All right, Hollow <laughs> Knight. Yes. Hollow um, <laughs> so I I mentioned it last time, but I had only played like a smidgen of it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm quite always into it now. I'm not I'm not quite at twenty hours. I want to say if you look at if you look at Steam, it'll say that I've played around ninety hours of that game. Untrue. I just keep yes, it yeah. <laughs> I, I've I've had a few issues with games like that as well. I realized oh yeah, I left this alt tabbed overnight. Shit. Now I don't know how long I played it for. Yeah, um, but that game is gorgeous. Like, it's so much bigger than you think it's going to be. Um, it's it's very Metroidvania in all of the ways that I appreciate, where it's like I don't always know where I am and um, just sort of like mapping out the world and finding new places all the time and uncovering. It has like some kind of like, Dark Souls elements to it as well. Um, not in the ways that you're going to assume. In in the fact that you find a lot of lore by looking at items that you have and by doing research about the creatures that you're killing and stuff yeah. like that. You uncover like a lot of information about the world and the people that were there. And it's that game is like a beautiful game that I don't think enough people know about. And I hope that more people give it a shot because it's just every area has a very specific look to it. There's so much love and attention to detail in every single aspect. The controls are really well responsive. Um, it's just a fantastic game. Like, I love it. It's, it seems to me, from what I've read about it, and I'm not... I'm not a fan of Metroidvania style games, but this is a much more Metroidvania style game than a lot of other titles that have been named as such. I know there was, there was an article, I can't remember who wrote it uh, a little while ago that was criticizing Hollow Knight and claimed, oh, if you want a modern Metroidvania, you should just go play Ori in the Blind Forest instead. I'm like, that's barely a Metroidvania. Like, yeah. Th there's a lot barely of people... any, you don't get lost in that game. There's barely any exploration whatsoever. This seems like it's far, far closer to what a Metroidvania game truly would be. You get lost in this game a lot, like a lot. And you get you get 
uh, sort of carried along into other areas that you didn't mean to go to, you mm -hmm. know, you'll, you'll uncover a, a zone or you'll wind up in, in a really big room and you're like, Oh shit, there's so many different ways that I can go in here. I want to explore all of it. And then the first one will be so engaging that you'll just keep going. And then you'll realize, Oh shit, that huge room back there. I never went into any of the other, you know, like <laughs> it's, it's really cool in that way. Um, I know that from talking to Octo, because there's there's a specific character where in each in each area you can <clears> find <throat> him and then you can buy the map off of him, but he only has part of it. Cause he's he's also like exploring, but his like big thing is making maps. So he'll be like, Oh, I've I've been to some of this if you would like my map so far. And mm -hmm. then you can continue to um build off of his map, but you can't build a map from scratch yourself. So like there's a huge zone that Octo said he never found the map guy. So he just had to do the entire zone without the map. Mm. Um, and so if you just, if you never find him, because he could be in a really obvious place, he could be in like a little dinky room off to the side that you accidentally ignore, right? And if you happen to never find him, you just won't have a map. Um, and that's, I, I kind of love that. Octo hates it. <laughs> but I've, I, I kind of love it. And maybe I love it because I've always managed to find the guy eventually, you know? So I've never, I've never had to do an entire area being like, I have no idea where the fuck I am. <laughs> 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 because if you don't have the map, it, it really limits you in terms of being able to look at it and say, oh, I need to go back and go into this place because I never went there. You know, if, if you want to complete the map, you have to find the map guy eventually. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I, I love that feeling of just like, Ooh, this is a whole new place and I don't have a map and I have no idea where I am, but I'm going to just, I'm going to just go for it and see where I wind up, you know, it helps to have a it map. winds up being really fun. I really <laughs> wanted to play it. I tried to boot it up today. It doesn't recognize my controller for some reason. And I don't want to use keyboard and mouse. It just Wait. does not recognize no, that I have a yeah, don't use keep your <laughs> yeah, mouse. No. It just does not recognize that I have a 360 controller plugged in, and I that's was totally trying bizarre. It. Yep, and I, I, I was I was reading, I, I googled it, and it's not an uncommon problem with the game for one ah, reason or another. Interesting. Weird. Mm. I hadn't heard about that at all. That I've sucks. come across a couple of games that have done that. It's not a common problem that happens all that often, but yeah, I have definitely yep. run across that once or twice. Made me sad. Mm. Interesting. Fair enough. It looks gorgeous. The game is oh, beautiful yeah. looking. So that's, I mean. It's one of those things where I was like, I need to play this, and I will play this. I just haven't had time to play it. I think you'd love it, Jesse. Um, people are saying it takes around, if you want 100% the game, it takes like 40 hours. Yeah. Um, but you can beat the game uh, in 20 to 30. Mm. So. That's fair. I'm, it's not my kind of thing because I don't like getting lost in games, and this is obviously <laughs> a game in which you can definitely get fair lost. Enough. That's not my, not my thing, but... I mean, it obviously looks gorgeous and well designed. Shame mm -hmm. it comes out at a time where it's sort of flanked by so many major releases. Hopefully, yeah. it's able to make it out of that regardless. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a problem for quite a few games over the next couple of weeks. There's so much stuff coming out <laughs> yeah. at the moment. Uh, I can't believe how many huge, like big games, all came many. out at the same time. Yeah, it's too many. And they're still coming. They're still coming. You know, obviously, we got Ghost Recon today. Mass Effect is out very soon. Nia came out today on PS4 and is next week on PC. Well, it's like Christmas. I don't understand why March is like fucking chaos. March games is bonkers. Right yeah, it's crazy. Man, I just I wanted to find time to play Ghost Recon so bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, to talk about that because I just haven't played it yet. And all I know is what Force has been so telling me in the chat is like, boring. it's boring. It is. I've played it too. And it's fucking boring. All right, you've played it. So let's hear. Let's hear a little bit about it then. Uh, Ghost Recon Wildlands, which seems like the least Ghost Recon Ghost Recon to have a Ghost Recon. It's an arcade game, is what it is. So Ghost Recon Wildlands is set to in an open world, of course, as Ubisoft. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're tasked with like these quests of going and finding guys and kidnapping them or killing them, depending. But what it boils down to. And there's classes. Each you can you can pick a class and like talents and two specs and all this other stuff. But <laughs> Talent, fucking... skills, experience. Yep. That's yeah. Exactly. It's, it's sure it's as hell that. sounds like not Ghost Recon at all. But it's 
oh god so the point is like this map is giant too it's a the map is giant it's 21 different like zones i guess um but all you're doing is you're you're going into this town where there's ai you pop out of the car you mow down the ai you kill the boss you or boss you kill the guy you're looking for or you kidnap the guy you're looking for leave and then get a quest to go do the same thing in a different town in a little bit of a different distance and drive there or fly there if you have a helicopter or whatever uh oh, yeah. the ai is so stupid that you can stay super far away with a silent sniper rifle and just pick them off oh no <laughs> you're just like all right well this is great and i'm told the best way to play it is on like extra hard with the hud off and that makes it harder but yes. the AI, the AI is, it doesn't feel like a Ghost Recon game. And I love Ghost Recon. I've been playing Ghost Recon since like the original Xbox when I first, you know, got into like shooters and stuff uh, and how ta like those multiplayer matches were so tactical and tense. And this is like, it's like terrorist road tripping, uh, terrorist killing road trip with it's, your bros. That's my, exactly what it is. What I've seen of it so far just reminds me of Just Cause Without a Sense of Humor. Yep, that's yeah, they, it's something we were talking about before this. It, it's a huge open world with none of the toys and way too serious of a tone and mm. no variety. Oh, like dear. if I could, you should just go play. You should honestly just go play Just Cause. This, what's so crazy about this is everything boring. about the game seems like this should be a fun, not too serious, like romp game with friends where you fucking just do crazy shit and like live the dream of being a wild hunter of people. But like... <laughs> I don't know. It sucks to hear that it's boring. Like that's the that's the worst thing a video game can have is just being boring. It is so mm. bland. That is it's 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 a very pretty game. Like the landscapes are gore, like gorgeous and colorful and they look good. The game ran fine uh on PC for me. Like it controlled fine, but it just God, there was no variety. And it was so it was very arcadey. And I was what I was hoping for was a game where I could like load up with two or three friends and like be stealth and like work out tactics. Like I'm gonna be the sniper, so I'm gonna be on this mountain like three miles out while you go in in a helicopter and drop off somebody else into the town and shit like that. And you're like, we're gonna tackle this in a very strategic way, but it's not. You can just drive in, all of you have machine guns. You're just like, I'm just a badass US soldier. You're all dead now. Congratulations town, you're now free of, of terrorism. Next town, and you just hit the road <laughs> and then you go down the next way and you do the same thing. <laughs> Congratulations, no terrorism town. left in this town. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me on the map. It, there's a terrorism bar and it goes down to zero percent. It's like terrorism free. It and it's just a big like American that, flag, like, fireworks everywhere. Is, like, civilians are running around, but then after the dudes are dead, they come out and they're just like, well, I guess we're fine. Now. Yeah. <laughs> it just Back sounds like life. A boring version of Sniper Elite 4, by the sounds of it. Like, I, we need to play that TV. We do, yeah. We want to do way. the hard difficulty Dude. sort of spot yes. uh, sniper mode and <laughs> like, stuff like they that. They go into town, and you can free these dudes that, like, they're just, like, captured rebel soldiers. And they're, like, in a big green cage, and it just looks silly. Like, they're outdoors in a cage, and they're like, free us. Like, I mean, I guess <laughs> yeah, free so. Free us, please. And you go <laughs> in, and you mark uh, supplies, and then, like, you put a little device in the supplies, and you gain the supplies, and you use the supplies to upgrade your talents. And it's just... Oh, it's so derivative and boring. That sounds like The Division, like it, in many, many ways, honestly. Yeah, but at least The Division now has that multiplayer mode that's That good. survival mode that's really good, yeah, yeah. that's true. Mm. I, I can't say I'm looking forward to playing it. I, I don't really, I wasn't don't looking forward. I, well, I'll have to, yes. I'll, I'll have to try it, but. <laughs> just, you're going to be so bored. It's like, I, I just... bought it now, and I'm going to have to try it. I'm going to get my money's worth out of it, but. Just, just shout like. Like while you're playing, like freedom has arrived, and you're like, all right, you're getting in the mood, and I just, it's more uh, fun. I just all I imagine now is just the guy just like, congratulations, you're free of terrorism, <laughs> and then they drive away. <laughs> yeah, no, they do. Then leave. you drop in a car and you drive <laughs> off, and then you do, and you just go like three minutes down the road. There's another town that needs freedom, and you jump <laughs> out and you just start freeing. Them Have all. some freedom. You That's start, exactly what it is. You start freeing everyone. <laughs> But Load the, the freedom is, bullets, uh, disperse the soldiers, them amongst the population. The characters you're playing aren't over the top. They take everything so seriously. Right, of but course. But while you're running down the street, mowing down terrorists. Oh my God. How much tango down is there in the game? I didn't hear many tango downs. Well, I mean, that's a disappointment. Yeah, but I'm sure it's, there's <laughs> enough. That would have made the game so much money. better. <laughs> so Not much tango better. downs, zero out of 10. Uh, oh dear. If they had just went over the top with it, then, and that's like, what I'm saying. That's kind of what I expected. Go with it, man. Like, you almost, you, 
if you're going to basically like drag the Ghost Recon franchise through the mud, and I say that right? very truthfully because every ah. Ghost Recon game up to this point has been has actually stuck to the formula to some extent. It's you know, Advanced Warfighter and Future Soldier, etc., were not the same as the original Ghost Recon games, but right. they were close enough, and they all followed this pattern of you are a futuristic sort of recon ops team with various technological advantages over your opponent. A lot of it involved advanced HUD elements, which is why turning off the HUD in Wildlands is kind of the antithesis of what I would want. Because I remember Ghost Recon was like, everything's blue and highlighted, and I've got infrared here, and I track my squad all this way, and yeah, all this and cool shit. Yeah, you can still like, plan and strategize in that one. Your advantage yeah. in this game is that you have a brain, and yeah. they do not. Mm -hmm. I... <laughs> I love this comment in chat. It's the best thing about this game is it's ghost ops, so you technically don't exist, but you can put American flags all over your shit. Oh, God. <laughs> I think that's really funny. It's like, we don't even exist, and there's just American <laughs> flags everywhere. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah, terrorism. <laughs> it, just, it, it just doesn't seem like anything like what Ghost Recon is. It seems like a poor man's version of Metal Gear Solid Five, from what I can tell. Oh, it's not even that. No, it's it's, it's worse than that. Because oh, at yeah. least in Metal All Gear right. Solid Five, you can get creative. Like, there's some cool things you can do. You can kidnap soldiers and set kidnap up boxes horses. with like, a balloon dude that pops yeah. out. Here, the most creative thing you can do with a friend is like, all right, I'm going to mark a target, and you're going to mark a target. I'm going to press a button. It's going to count down three, two, one, and on one, we both and shoot, and they both die. The kill, yeah. Yeah. It's, so, it's, wow, that sounds really dull. It's, it's so dull. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, chat. Yeah, it's realism. American soldiers can just run into town, not take cover, and mow everybody down. <laughs> Liberation? <laughs> Liberation. Yeah. Oh, dear. So it's a shame. Pretty sure that's not how that works. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think so either. Well, I'm not exactly enthused for that. I'll have to check it out later. Oh, You're going to be very bored. Uh, um, it's entirely possible. TB, you tried out desync, right? I did, yes. I, I also tried it. out desync. Yeah. Um, that was the game that we that we for the viewers. That was the game that we saw in the release list last week. Um, yeah, I also played was, it at PAX almost a year ago. Yeah, it's like a it's like a super uh, polygon, very Tron esque shooter. shooter game. Yeah. yeah, very Tron. You know, if you don't like RGB distortion effects, you will hate this game because a lot of that. <laughs> Awful yeah. lot of that's like, hey, remember CRT monitors? We sure do. Enjoy all of this sort of thing. Yep. Uh, it, it's that sort of, it's got a bit of bullet storm in it in the sense that it's based around weapon combos and com combining various weapons and alt fires and abilities to create these special kills that not only give you extra points, but they often reward you with things like health or additional ammo. And there are some enemies that can only be easily killed by using these particular things. You could juggle enemies in the air, shoot them back into spike pits and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And there's apparently some even more advanced concepts involving these so-called synced enemies, which are different colors that have a bunch of different additional abilities. And they're very hard to kill, but supposedly you can create some sort of weapon chain where you'll trigger a desync on them I, I haven't got far enough in the game to understand that part of it all yeah. i know is there's quite a lot to it and some people have very clearly misunderstood every aspect of it maybe the game just doesn't explain it all that well but it hammered it in pretty early on to me that you've got to be doing these special kills that's I mean, kind of the game yeah the um the game is difficult from the get-go it is and pretty tricky that yes that put off some people that like it doesn't it doesn't ease you into anything it's like here oh, you no. go you have a gun and here's a fuckload of enemies and you're like <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah and then it immediately starts telling you okay well here's a special kill that you can get that is going to give you health back if you do it he has a much easier way to kill this he has a second gun he has a bunch of combinations of trick shots that you can do and if you're doing those trick shots it makes the game a shit ton fucking easier if you don't, you're going to be shooting bullet spongy enemies that don't die very quickly and run out of ammo. Especially you... bearing in mind that one of those sync kills is designed to give you ammunition back. So if you don't right. do it, you're going to run out of ammo. Um, can you play this game with controller? I mean, you probably could, but it's a first-person shooter. Why do you want to? Yeah. I don't know. Just because... Like, <laughs> the... You revealed your casual nature, Dodger. Well, Too late. It's hard How dare you have personal preferences? Because I, I think... Uh, what's the dodge? Is it Q? The key bindings are a bit weird. Uh, yeah, they feel weird. I don't like using your offhand, I think, is E, which is pretty hard to do when you're using WAS and D. You'd have to rebind the defaults for it to make sense, I think. Yeah, that's why I was like, man, I wonder if 
it would be easier to hit all of the buttons you're trying to hit at the same time with a controller. I'd just bind but them to mouse buttons, aiming honestly. Would suck. If you've got a mouse yeah. with more than three buttons, bind them to the extra buttons, you'll probably be in a good shape after That's that. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. It it seems like it's got quite a lot of depth. I don't know if the game does a brilliant job of explaining that depth, but since I understand the basic concepts and I'm going out of my way to look for these special kills and how these enemies work, I shouldn't have too much of a problem with it. I, I found mm. it relatively interesting, like, mechanically. It doesn't seem to have much of a story, and if it does, it's quite convoluted and weird. So I, I'm just concerned that, you know, if we were to make the comparison to Bulletstorm, the reason we make that comparison is that they were both quite... Uh, tied around the notion of trick shot kills and so-called skill kills and skill shots that involve using the environment and different combinations of weapons to greater effect. If you combine, the, if you compare those two games, Bulletstorm obviously has a lot more forward momentum because it's got an actual story driving you along and funny voice acting and great pacing. This game is a lot, there's barely any of that. So you, you've got to, I think, very much like the gunplay to enjoy the game. If you don't, there's probably not a lot else going for it to keep you interested. So it'll be very dependent on that. Yeah. Not too bad, though. I haven't played enough of it, really, to get uh, to get a real grasp of it yet, though. Same. Uh, I did play a bunch of a game that popped up again a couple of weeks ago called Northland. Popped up in our release list. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, okay. yeah, yeah. It's an early access. It's a sort of Norse slash fantasy Viking town building-ish game. Nor Northgard? Northgard, is it? Is it yes. Northgard, not Northland? Yeah, yes. I'm pl I've played that too. I fucking yeah, it's like cool. that game. A not, lot. not Northland at all. It's not Northgard. Yes. I, I thought it was like Nordland or something. I keep getting confused. Yeah, it's Northgard. Currently in early access. And I played a couple of rounds of it. It's it's very much a sort of settlers esque mm -hmm. resource management town building game. So people have compared it to Banished. It's nowhere near as difficult as that. Like, not mm -hmm. even close. Like, Banished no. is a game where you balance everything on a fine edge, otherwise your entire town dies of hunger or plague or whatever. There's not much of that here. There is resource gathering. You can totally run out of food and people can starve and such, but it's quite unlikely to happen. It's very easy to get supply chains going to the point where that will not happen. There's seasons, which mean that, you know, during winter it's very hard to farm and so on and so forth. There are interesting little parts of the map that you can explore with a scout who... You can, can't access areas of the map until a scout goes and scouts it. And when he scouts it, he reveals the area. You can walk into it, and sometimes he'll find special things like a stone pillar that you can worship at or a shipwreck that you can investigate and find gold from, etc. Cool. And he, the area is the maps are divided into zones, which can only have a certain number of buildings in them, uh, which it feels a little odd at first because it feels it's very gamey. It's very inorganic. So it's like, oh, I've got tons of space, but I can't put another house here because there's a limit of four buildings I can have in this zone. That's weird. But once you get over that, you've got various things like diplomacy with not only the other factions, but also the they've got like the, uh, I think they've got, I'm not sure they're Jormungir or Jotun or something along those lines on the map. They're, they're giants, basically. And there's these kind of Viking mythological giants. You can attack them if you want and get murdered, or if you keep trading food with them, they might join you and all that sort of thing. This looks so cool. I it need is, to play this. It's gorgeous, too. I yeah. really love how it looks. It's, uh, yeah, it's definitely a nice-looking game. There's no doubt about that. There's a bunch of factions missing, obviously, yeah, it's because... it's pretty early still, on. Yeah, I mean, what, what's in it plays well, honestly. Yes, it looks very good, polished. Controls relatively well. Uh, there's a couple of issues that I've got with changing worker jobs, like, because your citizens can have different jobs, and... Sometimes in order to switch them, you've got to send them back to the town hall to convert back into a citizen before they'll switch over. And often because you have dudes assigned to mine and these like stone quarries run out very fast, you usually have a bunch of people standing around doing nothing. Because like, well, why don't you just automatically revert back to a citizen and go and uh, gather food for me automatically instead of just sitting there being an idiot or that sort of thing. <laughs> so there's a little bit of more micromanagement there than otherwise is necessary, I think. The combat system is fairly basic. You get like a war band that can be led by a war chief and you can send that little army in to attack the enemy. There's also a bunch of events, like they'll summon demons in the middle of your town. You've got to fight those and mythological creatures and stuff. It's got some potential. Uh, it could use a yes. bit more on the management side, you know, longer supply chains, yeah. more complex stuff. There are some pretty cool elements to it. You, uh, If they have a map of lava, you can apparently reforge the Sword of Odin by building like Ordin's awesome. Forge or whatever. Great. 
Um, I, I'd love to see more stuff like that. Like, just pile on more of the mythological stuff and make the town and city management a little bit more advanced so that there's more to manage and more to think about and more decisions to make. And I think it'll turn into a really good time. I played a, say I played a couple of maps worth of rounds of it. I beat them all fairly easily. It wasn't much of a challenge, but I think yeah. that it's got potential. They could, if they could work on it, it'll be pretty damn cool. Yeah, I played a bunch of that. Uh, let's see, what else? <clears throat> um, I played a little bit of Nier Automata yesterday. Ah, yes, yes. You got the little uh, pre-release stream with Square Enix, I believe. Yeah, we yeah. weren't we weren't paid. Um, it was just they an just, early like, access thing. Yeah. Yeah, they just came out uh, with like a a dev PlayStation um, and let us play basically like the beginning of the game, which is mm. almost identical to the demo that a lot of people got to play, and then they let us do uh, one other area that's further on in the game. Um, that game is super fun. Like the way that that game like switches perspectives while you're playing it and the way that you can do like combos and the dodge mechanics and everything it like feels really good to it's a play. platinum game yeah so it's a nice it's it's a the masters very of that. platinum game also yeah, good. i'm excited for that <laughs> i mean that's already yeah. the reason why i'll probably make my top 10 just on the basis that it's a good platinum game i'm excited like, i'm super every excited time they one. release a good one i want it and nia is a really interesting world to base it in I yeah. played a bunch of the original. I will be damned if I can remember the story because it's weird and convoluted by the guy that made Drakengard, so it makes very little sense. But the yeah. world was beautiful and strange and mournful and kind of a sorrowful, empty, lonely place. It was like, oh, this is beautiful, but sad. It reminded me of Shadow of the Colossus. Like, this is a beautiful mm. world, but there's something sad about it. But, uh, yeah. Obviously, the robot I'm aspect is very strange and all that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm super pumped because it looks like right up my alley gameplay wise. I didn't definitely don't plan on playing the first one. It didn't seem anything interesting. It's but not the same kind of game. Yeah, no, I hear it's not the same kind of game. But if you're interested in what the story is, uh, Super Bunny Hop did like a 27 minute video breaking down the story of the he game. Did, yes, oh, watch cool. that. It's really yeah. good. Like I'm like, oh, I get some kind of what's happening in the world now. And yeah, the world might is, be worth like it. you said, it's fucking weird. Yeah, unless they remaster Nia, it's probably not worth playing Nia. Yeah. It would be lovely if they remastered it. I think it was a beautiful game back then. It could be even better now. The interesting it's thing. It's so fucking anime. Holy yeah. shit. Uh, that last bit when in the demo, when the, the building you're on becomes the robot and you fight yeah. it, it's the most <laughs> yeah. fucking ludicrous thing I've ever seen in my life. I'm like, I love everything about it. It was amazing. Yeah, because you have like those two buzz saws, right? And then they disappear. And I was like, holy fuck, if those turn into arms, I'm going to lose my shit. And then like, <laughs> they like, did. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> like, oh! When and it comes then, to the bosses, end, you're literally, platinum are unmatched. You're literally flying a ship, and then you grab, you rip off one of its own arms <laughs> and use its own buzzsaw arm to kill it. I was like, this is the fucking yes. greatest thing I've ever seen. Yes. I love it. Yeah, and I love um I love that when you're when you're like piloting one of your your like Gundams, I don't know. Yeah. When you're when you're a, a war robot. Uh, it turns into like a, a bullet hell. It, yeah. It's like yeah. a really intense bullet hell too. You're like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, I heard there was perspective change and genre mashing going on in this, which- It's awesome. It's very so interesting cool. for a platinum game. Yeah, uh, sometimes it's a side scroller. Sometimes incredible. it's like a third person brawler. It's like, great. I'm very, very excited to play it. I, I'm tempted to play it on PlayStation knowing that it runs on PS Pro at 60 apparently. Well, as most platinum games do. Wow, yeah, nice. I'm so excited. I, so excited. Or I can PS wait a week for the P the PC version. I don't know. It's. I remembered uh, it, uh, when uh, Metal Gear Rising came out. I just I got it on PS3 because it ran pretty well on PS3. But then I finished the game on PC, and I was like, right. mm, I don't know. Uh, but here's one interesting thing that I have heard, and this is sort of a pseudo spoiler. Feel free to tune out for the next minute if you are very worried. I'm not going to tell you a story element per se. What I'm going to tell you is the fact that the ending Endings. is not the ending. The, the game is designed to be played multiple times. Oh. The ending no, is not cool. the ending. There's mm. some crazy shit, apparently. So if you're worried that, hey, oh, it's a platinum game, it probably has a five or six hour campaign like most of them do. It's designed that way. You want to play it again. And can again. You, can I tell you my dream? The game ends. 
and the game itself becomes a robot that you then have to fight. Oh <laughs> shit! <laughs> yes, um, the entire game's like fuck it. <laughs> so something that actually happened is uh. We decided just for a goof when we were doing this stream that we were going to play on very hard. Turns out that very hard for this game is everything is a one hit kill and there are no Lovely. <laughs> there are no checkpoints. Pass. So yeah, so you have to just Pass. like literally never ever get hit. Oh my! Um, so I was the first person to play. Uh, died in the tutorial, right? <laughs> like really quick. Just got hit by something and it was game over. Um, and that was an ending. It like it it goes into the credits and the credits just fly by super fast. At the end. I love it. I love it when games. <laughs> Speaking of that, there's there's another game that I haven't. I've literally only played a minute of this so far. That pulls this shit on you, and that's Torment: Tides of Numenera. I died in the I first thirty five so seconds bad. and got an ending. I want to play that game so bad. The first thing it asked me is like, are you male or female? Then it gave me a bunch of text, and then it gave me a bunch of choices. You are falling towards a planet. What do you do? Me being like the idiot I am, I'm like, speed up! <laughs> Within 30 seconds of that, and it goes through a bit more text, it's like, you remember as you're falling the words uh, terminal velocity and blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, you died. This is the end. Uh, all that's left of you is a small crater on the surface of this planet and a bunch of splat around. And that's it. It's like, that's an ending. It's like, great, <laughs> cool. This, uh, this really sets the scene. That's actually as far as I got. I haven't come back to the game. <laughs> I do I do mean to, but Good. yes, you can you can die and get an ending within the first 30 seconds of Planes of uh, Torment, Tides of Numenera. I refuse to play that game until I play Planescape Torment. Well, you'll Which be is... on for a while then. That game... I know. It's going to be I... a long time. Yeah, I'm excited for Numenera. It's shout out to When are you going to get time to play like... it? It, yeah, explaining, like, having done that world, I'm really excited to see what this is going to be. Again, it comes down to the fact that fuck everyone for making every game come out in March. Like, this right? Is, yeah. It really I, is. I, I thought I was going to have the time to maybe go back and play something like Tyranny, which I never got around to doing. No fucking chance. No yeah. way. Uh, there's too much shit coming out at the moment. And they're uh, not like short, they're not like short experience no, they're not. games. No, they're <laughs> they're not. all fucking like open world or massive RPGs. It's like, God damn, guys, calm down. <laughs> oh my God. Well, I just don't understand why this March is like the time. It's uh, nuts. It's God, crazy. Man. Even for me, who often ignores a lot of the big releases because they're stuff that I've kind of played before, there's still shit like Nia and Mass Effect and all that sort of thing coming my way. I'm like, God damn it. Uh, these are big games that are going to take a lot of my time. Fucking hell! Yeah. Uh, apparently, it's probably it's probably a lot to do with the tax year. I imagine, isn't it? Like that's probably uh, why. Uh, it's the same yeah. reason the Switch release when it did, right? They're trying to get it out before the tax year ended or something. Or Maybe something like that. But and, and then there's a lot of small stuff that looks really great, like Loot Rascals, which just came out today. I yeah. want to play a bunch of. I played a little bit of Ultimate Marvel, which just came out on PC. And it's it's great. I mean, it's a good port. It runs well. The netcode is good. It's as good as console version anyway. And the only problem I've got with it is that it, it now is inexplicably detecting my hitbox, which is a PS3 controller, as an X-input device, which means that while I can rebind the buttons in the game, it's pure guesswork as to what they'll end up being. Because the hitbox doesn't have any of those things. On. Usually with a fighting game, if it doesn't have proper direct input support i'll use something like x pattern and i just bind to keys i've got a nice little setup with it where like this is up down left right blah blah and then i have the eight buttons and i bind them to the keyboard buttons and then i just use keyboard control in the game and it works perfectly and that mm -hmm. let me play stuff like street fighter etc really well but this one it has that keyboard support but it thinks my controller is an x input device so it's like this is an xbox control like, it's <laughs> not it isn't stop it stop <laughs> it i can't control this fucking thing oh god uh, it's a very specific problem not many people own hitboxes so i can't imagine that it's widespread but just be be aware that that might be an issue for you uh just it may it may come to bite you in the ass. I'm just gonna have to sit down at some point and do a full on trial and error of every button to eventually figure out what each button refers to. Yeah, uh, it's like oh god, kill me now. What the fuck? Uh, but uh, other than that, the game runs great. It's got all the DLC. It's got the heroes and uh, heralds mode, so it's got more single player content. Yes, you could beat the shit out of people as Frank West, Phoenix Wright, 
and uh, Amateretsu team if you wish. And it's great. Just don't play online because you'll get murdered by people who are 5,000 times as good as you. That sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I remember thinking you. back in the day, I used to be a good Marvel vs. Capcom 2 player. And then I watched people play Marvel vs. Capcom 2 in a tournament. I'm like, I can't do any of these things. These guys are just juggling the dude for two minutes. Yeah. It was the same with nice. Ultimate Marvel 3. I'm like, what the fuck? Uh, uh, this, I, I just, I fell, I fell into a deep depression <laughs> after that and never went back to uh, Marvel vs. Capcom ever again. But... I don't know, it's just like, do I really want to learn that fighting game? I mean, that's really a fighting game kind of on its way out. Should I? I really should be learning either Guilty Gear or fucking Street Fighter Five. Like, yeah. oh dear. It, but uh, the port's good and it's well priced, so I appreciate that. Uh, Capcom's been pretty much nailing it lately with a lot of their ports, so good on them. Uh, they really seem to have got the hang of how this sort of thing's supposed to work, and it's good to see fighting games on PC. Why not? Yeah. I don't believe there's any crossplay though, so. If you're going in there expecting a big online community, you might be disappointed. Thankfully, the game does have decent single-player mode, although by no means on the part of uh, Mortal Kombat or anything. So, right. bear that one in mind. Uh, what did I? Uh, something else I, I played. played. Oh, go for it! I what you got? played uh, a lot of Oxygen, not included. Ah, yes. By that Clay. Mm -hmm. Apparently, a thing the kids are into. The as kids a are play. into that game. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Space survival First, game by Clay. Clay makes great shit. It's a yeah. It's a it's a RimWorld esque game um, it is. where yes, you're managing a colony, but instead of top down, it's like two D, very like uh, ant farm in the mm -hmm. way you're building colony. Um, it's very Clay. Uh, it, it's it's gorgeous. The art style is fantastic. It's very very funny. Isn't it bizarre um, that you can always spot a clay game yet they never have the same aesthetic twice? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. They have such a unique style that is so flexible. Uh -huh. They can do so many different things with it. Uh, generally, the idea is you're just you create like three colonists uh, and you're just digging out in this area and just trying to survive. And you have to de uh, deal with their stress and all this other, th other stuff. The, the, the colonists twist are on shit. They're really bad. Like in every way, and that's what, part of the best thing about it. Again, very dwarf fortress esque kind of yeah. idea, where it's like losing is fun. Uh, can I just yeah. say I love the fact that people are starting to take the dwarf fortress formula and making it more decipherable and accessible. Because I love God, the idea man. of dwarf fortress. I just Me don't have the too. three years required to learn how to play dwarf fortress. Rim World is the way to go if you want a, like a, a close to pure dwarf fortress esque experience without yeah, I've been you told know, that. learning that. Um, but the, the cool thing, the thing that makes uh, Oxygen Not Included unique compared to the others is the management of gases. Uh, because as the title says, oxygen is not included. You're kind of like in this rocky planet and you have a limited supply of oxygen to, to start with. Yep. You need to build buildings that are going to produce oxygen. And in hmm. order for those, those buildings to produce oxygen, you need to give them like algae, which you mine out, uh, which is a pretty limited resource. And you, then you need to build other machines that produce oxygen in other ways, but also can then produce hydrogen. Um, you have to deal with carbon dioxide, which will, you have to learn how the gases work. So carbon dioxide will always sink to the bottom. Yeah, there's while... a real, there's an actual physics based system of like the, the yeah. weights of these gases and how they flow around. And you can yep. exploit that, you can exploit that to the point where you can apparently generate electricity by using steam from, like, use, you can redirect lava to heat up a pool of water to generate steam, which will then yep. power a generator. It's like, holy shit, this is cool. Yeah, it, it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly, um, especially since right now the, the world that, that it gives you is not infinitely generated. It no. is relatively small, still and you an will alpha. run out of resources pretty quickly. Yeah, it's still early access. It's still very early, but what they have there that is, is incredibly polished. And once you know what you're doing, you can still get good four or five hours of entertainment out of the game in its current state. Um, it's very clay is like really the, the way. And it's unique aspect is the gas and the liquid management of the game itself outside of keeping your colonists happy. Um, it's really cool. fun to get a colonist who when stressed decides to just shit all over the floor. Yeah. And if they do that, it will uh, contaminate the water. And if mm -hmm. the water drips into your clean water supply, will then contaminate your clean water supply yep. and make all your other colonists sick. And then they will just start dying. And if you leave their bodies there, that will start contaminating the air yep. and the water and all this other everything stuff. Everything works. Uh, everything has an impact on everything else. Big cause and effect. Yes. Thing. But Huge you, think, cause you could and also use that shit as fuel, potentially. Yep. Oh, you can fer like, take the fertile and you make it as fertilizer as well. Yep. But you got to get Crazy. to it quick because if you leave shit sitting out, it will start contaminating the oxygen. And yep. oxygen has like a five or six tier breathability where it's like very breathable, uh, breathable, 
sort of toxic, very toxic, not like, then it's just like, you can't breathe it at all. And they will start getting stressed and sick. Uh, and each each colonist has like a unique way they deal with stress once they hurt at a certain point. Some will shit everywhere, some will vomit everywhere. Some will run around the colony and break everything they can get their hands on. <laughs> uh, it's it, it can get, and once that happens, it can get chaotic very quickly and to the point where you might just back away and let it happen. Very cool. Just let them die. Mm, it's good. I can't wait. It is very good. It's going to be really interesting indeed to see how that one turns out. I'm probably going to wait for it to be a little bit more developed than it is before I give it a real shot. Yeah, I'd say only dive in if you're like a hardcore enthusiast of this kind of stuff and you want to get it on the ground floor. Because like I said, once you know what you're doing, maybe four or five hours at most. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I've been playing a bunch of Drop Zone. I meant to bring this up, I think, two weeks ago, and it just never got around to it. <laughs> it was a thing we were going to do, but... I could talk about it now. So Drop sure. Zone is a game that I got to play at PAX last year. I actually ended up on stage playing it. I had no plans to do that. I just, I, sh I showed up at the booth. It looked kind of interesting. It and is I, interesting. I, and I introduced myself and I played a couple of games like, do you want to maybe stream it on our stage against some audience members? And me being the arrogant, egotistical <laughs> bastard that I am. Own it, man. I want, be, I want cheers. I want the cheers and the roar of the crowd. So yeah, I, I sat up on there and played against audience members and beat them all. And then a dev came and humbled me in front of everybody. But <laughs> the game has been in alpha for quite some time. It got to Steam into its beta stage. So it actually has a player base now. Fairly small one, admittedly, but a player base nonetheless. And I've been playing quite a bit of it and I'm starting to really get into this game. It's cool. It is. It is very cool indeed. And it is basically a, I don't know if you call it a hybrid of the, it, they're sort of calling it a hybrid of real-time strategy and Dota style or MOBA games. I, I mean, I would argue that those games came from RTS to begin with. So it's a bit, bit weird to say that. But the point is that you, instead of controlling a single hero, you control a squad of three. And there, you can pick pilots, and you can pick mechs for those pilots, and you can customize those mechs with different items and weapons and loadouts. And you do that from the very start of the game in the loadout screen. You don't buy any of them in the game. You just start off with it. And they, it also visually customizes each mech, which is a very cool aspect of it. And you end up on the map, and it's a 15-minute match. And whoever wins is the person with the most score. And the way that you score is by collecting these purple cores, which drop from these so-called hives, which are these big, nasty worm creatures in the ground. You kill them, they drop cores, you pick the cores up, you take them to the center of the map, and you cash them in, basically. So anyone that's played Heroes of the Storm and played something like the Pirate's Cove map will be very familiar with that cash-in idea. It takes a few seconds to cash everything in, and all that kind of thing. But there's a few other ways to make uh, points. You can Each map has three objectives, which rotate. So, for instance, you might get a point for First Blood, you might get two points for taking all four watchtowers on the map, as you can see on the screen right now. You might get four points for being the first guy to kill three bosses, etc. So you've got to, and since there's a time limit, you've got to be a bit careful about how you prioritize what you're doing. Now, since you have three units, once you start to get good at it, you start to split up. So instead of sending your entire squad around wandering as a group of three, which is effectively a waste of time, you could send one guy to one hive to the left, send two other guys over here, which means, of course, you get more experience and you can get a level advantage over your opponent. Whenever you level up, it can activate pieces of gear that you put on your mech before you started the game. Hmm. And certain pieces of gear require certain levels to activate. So maybe you kit out a mech that's very early game orientated, where they have access to all of their abilities really early on. Or maybe you kit one out that's more late game orientated, and that's probably more powerful, but it takes longer for you to get there. And whenever you get a team level up, you can then apply that level up to one of the three mechs. So you can choose which mech gets the level. So you can choose which gear gets activated at a particular time. So there's a lot of strategy in building your squad. And then, of course, you, you do a lot of fighting. And what's weird about the fighting is you don't get any points for killing the enemy. You don't even get any experience for it. None. The whole point of fighting the enemy is to take map control and get them off the map for a time so you can cash in objectives. It's right. a purely objective-focused game. You can win the game without taking a single fight, if you wish. It, I mean, ultimately, it probably wouldn't happen because the opponent's going to try and contest what you're doing, but you can do that. It's a bit stressful, I have to say. <laughs> Managing three units, each with up to four active abilities each, 
Yeah, that's crazy. Is quite the thing. It takes a little bit of learning. You've got to play with the same squad to really get used to it. Once mm. you do, though, and once you start relying more on the minimap than looking at the screen and using auto attack and queuing commands, like, for instance, I can, just like a real-time strategy, I can queue my mech to walk over, pick up an orb, and then walk back to the middle of the map and cash it in and do all of those in a queue and not have to control it manually. Once you get the hang of that, things start to get a lot easier. And you start to do some really cool shit, you know, split pushes and confusing your opponent, being wherever the opponent isn't on the map, taking fights, drawing your opponent out of position while you cash in something else somewhere else. It, it's, a re it's got a lot of depth, actually. I think it's a really interesting game. The only problem I've got with it is that it seems really snowball-y to the point where it's possible for a comeback to become literally impossible. I'm not talking about hard. I'm talking about not numerically impossible. possible. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because the game's based on points, and there are only a finite number of points that can be earned in X amount of time because of the time it takes to cash in, the time it takes to kill the hives, the respawn time of the hives, and the number of things that are dropped by the hives, there can come a point where the enemy is so far ahead it is literally impossible for you to win because you will run out of time before, even if you do everything perfectly, you can't win. It's just not possible. So there are, there are advantages to having timed matches. Great for esports, very predictable game length. That's cool. Good for those of us that are sick of waiting an hour in Dota. We know it's going to be a 15-minute game. That's cool. Right. But the downside of that is, of course, that you get that feeling of, this is hopeless. I can't possibly win now. So I believe they're going to be implementing a graceful concede option where mm. the game figures out that it's numerically impossible for you to win now, so you're allowed to concede without too much of a penalty. That uh, would be nice. I yeah. think that's the way to go. Because it's just for, it, it, piss, it pisses you off. It's really frustrating. You can totally come back at certain parts of the game, and even if you lose the first few fights, that you're not out. You're totally not out. You can absolutely come back, but there does come a point of no return where it's impossible. So hmm. they need to do something about that point of no return. Otherwise, mm -hmm. really enjoyable, actually. A lot of fun. Yeah. yeah every time I played it, No, it, here's the thing. <laughs> it's not. Every time I played it, like you would think that at its core... You're controlling three units and you're yeah it's not though it, it's it actually is really intuitive and easy to play uh you just i mean if you've played an rts you can easily play this very easily play this yeah, so if, if you have any experience whatsoever with an actual real-time strategy absolutely you can you can pick this up but if you're used to playing something like league of legends where you control one hero one. Yeah. yeah you're sort of like oh god i'm controlling three. Oh god uh, but you have yeah. to play a bit more like an RTS with attack moves. Sometimes you focus fire, but attack move and Q commands, those are all pretty important. And of course, eventually you'll remember what all the abilities are for the three things. So it'll become muscle memory. But initially you're like, oh God, I don't know what any of these abilities do. Fuck. Oh God. Oh, uh, just th <laughs> spam everything. Just hit all the <laughs> buttons, throw them in this direction. Hopefully it'll be fine. But well, you know, once you start to get good at it, that ceases to be a problem. Yeah, it's it's fortunate they give you the trinity at the beginning that you can play a healer and a damage dealer and a tank and yeah. make that like your this is how I'm going to learn to play and all those abilities are so drastically different. It's like, okay, well, this one can give a shield and this one is a ground pound and this some one are is automatic a too. Like if you want to equip them with some auto kind of noob abilities, they're like mm -hmm. hey, when they go below a certain thing, this automatically activates. You can do that as well. But yeah. obviously the activatables give you a lot more tactical choices in a fight. Right. Uh, but you, and then you can set your team up however you want. Like you could have three tanks if you want. Like, yo, that's my, my go-to strategy, two tanks healer and just have them just pound their way through life. And it's yeah. like, <laughs> what up haters? No. What, I, what I love about the game is how oversized the weapons are, particularly on the tanks. Each weapon yeah. that you equip changes the look of the mech. And some of the weapons, like there's a giant hammer with a big smiley face on the bottom of it. And it's just a big pounder. There's, there's a grinder, mm, like big, big bulldozer pounder. flail thing. The, even the shields have like giant Tesla coils on the top of them. The yeah. big tank mech looks like a spider and all that shit. It's crazy. Uh, it's got this really cool aesthetic design to it. You can very easily identify what each mech's role is because they look like what you would expect them to look like. Uh, the worst team I've faced, I think, was uh, Recon, which is your fast damage dealer, and two summoners. Fuck that. That was the worst. They're, they're putting turrets all over the map. They're just being annoying motherfuckers. If you get anywhere close to them, they put down a force field that slows you. I'm like, I want to kill you! <laughs> this is the worst! Uh, but outside of that, though, it, I think it's got legs. I really do. It's sufficiently different 
It's got a little bit of RTS flavor and a little bit of MOBA in there and a little bit nice little balance between the two. And uh, it doesn't have, this is the one thing that I like, it doesn't have, even MOBAs have this, that starting downtime. Like, it, there's it, no it, downtime in this yeah, game. Yeah, it doesn't have that, like, we're waiting for the action to pick up. Like, you can just immediately go after the enemy. Like, F it. I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, the, the level is covered. It's mostly creeping that you have to do. Like, you play mm -hmm. Warcraft 3, you're very familiar with it. Every, the map is covered in hives, and you've got to attack those hives to get the cores that you need. So there's right. a lot of PvE, and the PvP usually happens when you try to disrupt your opponent's farm or disrupt your opponent cashing in an objective. So, yeah. no, there isn't a downtime because you're... As soon as you land, you should be immediately sending members of your team out to start killing dudes, because that's how you get your levels and experience. And if you get a level advantage over your opponent, that might be where you'd want to try and force a fight, because you've got the edge over that guy. Maybe you yep. get your dude to level five, so he gets his ultimate before they do, so you want to force a fight, because you've got an ultimate and he doesn't. But if you fuck that up, interestingly, if you rush for level five, it increases the respawn time on all of your shit. So if you, it's a gamble. If you fuck that fight up, your dudes are out for a minute. And that guy's going to just, hey, I'm going all the way around the map. I'm going to hang out all your shit. I'm going to steal all your cores. You know, obviously, you drop your cores when you die, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, it's got, it's really fun. It just, it has a, it's quite stressful and tense at the start. And it has a bit of a learning curve. Once you get over right. that hump, though, it's pretty cool. I imagine we're probably going to see 2v2 be the main mode in that game because it takes a bit of the stress off you. 1v1 is always like, it's all on you. Nobody is here to help you kind right. of thing. Uh, 2v2 is probably what's going to get legs because it's a bit more casual friendly, but it's a, it's a hell of a game. And it's by some of the guys that made Rise of Nations and shit. Sparky Pants oh, are their name. Cool. So they ha they've got some RTS pedigree behind them. Cool. Should we take a break? Yeah. And then sure. when we come back, we're going to be talking all manner of things. we got uh, Switch issues and stuff like that to talk about. So I can't wait to have fake news yelled at me again. Everything's perfect. The switch is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not on fire. <laughs> and Zelda's is perfect. 10 out of 10. It's not on fire. The fire is a feature. It's designed to warm your hands before you play Zelda so you get more better reaction times. Yes. That's I how believe it. It. It's I more know. realistic that way. Uh, we'll be right back. It's optional podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the co optional podcast. Jesse, you got your box Yo, of dreams. Showed it showed up. She's like, hey there, all. Yeah, yeah she's cute. so cute. Excellent. More plastic tat for your shelf. Yeah, plastic tat. I'm going to open up this plastic tat. You do that. You feel I free. Will. Live unboxing. How very exciting. Ooh. It's like it's like we're a YouTube channel. It's her, it's her black box. Well, yes. Because hmm. <laughs> in, in, in the game, they have the black... Moving on. So the Nintendo Switch, obviously, is out, and a lot of people are very excited about it. A lot of people are very happy about it. There have been stock shortages in some places, and I believe it was GameStop that said it was one of the biggest, most popular console launches they've seen in quite some time. It's obviously selling a good number of copies. There's a good amount of momentum behind it. It certainly looks like initially out of the gate it is going to be more successful on the Wii U. Who knows how long that momentum will continue, but... A good start for them nonetheless, but certainly not everything is rosy. There have been a few reported issues with the system. Three specific ones have come to light that uh -oh. are, Which are? <laughs> a fair bit, fairly large concern. Uh, the first one is that the plastic screen that this thing uses, it does not use Gorilla Glass or anything along those lines, it uses a plastic screen, is prone to scratching, and uh, in particular, the dock that is used for the Nintendo Switch is engineered in such a way that it's quite likely you will end up scratching the screen by putting the device the, the into dock? it. Yes. Yeah. Because the dock is poorly God. designed. It is, you know, it's got quite Actually, a lot of hard they... edges, not particularly rubberized or anything along those lines. Mm. It, and uh, quite a few people are showing and reporting after less than a week of use, scratches on the screen as a result of use yeah. with the dock of now, course yeah the dock has actually been taken off the nintendo store uh that by the way has just been remedied i okay. wanted to correct that because up until about an hour ago that was true apparently the news was misleading the person oh, that had reported okay. it it just it changed the product link on the store the oh, dock okay. is still for sale and it is out of stock at this present time but Surprise. yes, it is definitely still for sale. It was not taken off the store. If it had been, of course, that would be a tacit admission by Nintendo. We could have expected a statement that the dock was actually doing damage to the systems. But 
that obviously we haven't heard anything like that just yet. It's worth bearing in mind that while some people will defend it, saying, well, just be careful with it, this was a console that in many ways has been marketed to children who have a tendency of being less careful with such things. And the dock should not be built in such a way that it would cause that kind of damage. That's silly. Yeah. The dock also feels incredibly cheap. Yeah, and it costs $90 for a second dock, yep. which ridiculous. is unjustifiable. I saw a teardown of the thing where someone took the thing apart, and it's essentially a hunk of plastic with a small circuit board and your ports. And that's about it. That, it doesn't even yep. have a... We expected it would have cooling fans and things or a heat sink. None of that. Nope. nope. It's just a it's a plastic thing. And the weird thing about the design of the dock is that a lot of this screen scratching could have been avoided by not having the dock rise as high as it does. Like, it didn't actually have to cover the screen the way that it does. It's just Nintendo aesthetically wanted it that way. Yeah. If they had designed the dock in a way that that didn't happen then none of this screen scratching would be a factor. So it does seem a little strange the way that they've put that together. So do be careful if you're on Nintendo Switch. There is I think the potential there are for that. screen protectors you can get. Yes, there are. Uh, there is an issue with a lot of those screen protectors, though, because, <laughs> oh, yeah, they, here's, the, uh, here's the nice little addendum to this. The, uh, the majority of screen protectors have a tendency to bubble due to the heat that the system puts out Jesus because Christ. there isn't enough cooling on it. So if you want to use a screen protector, use the tempered glass screen protector, which is a bit more expensive. But bear in mind, there is the possibility that the heat generated by the system could cause the glue to lose its integrity. So th uh, this is one of several odd issues regarding the, the design. design. We had, a, we had a, a, it was like a few days ago, a third party company that makes a lot of wraps and vinyls and such announced via Reddit, they actually posted this saying, dudes, we've done tests to try and make vinyls and covers and skins for the Switch. We know a lot of you want them. There is what the materials we're using will not stay on the Joy-Cons because of the way that the material the Joy-Cons are made from, it causes wear and tear within the first 24 hours and the stuff just starts to shred, which is really strange. Huh. So there is, an, there is a couple of official skins available for this. We don't know there what I material am. they're made for, from. It could be some sort of proprietary thing. But as it stands, apparently third parties have not figured out a way to properly make a durable skin or vinyl for this system yet. Uh, which, I mean, for a portable system, I think there's a big market for that. If I owned mm -hmm. one, I'd definitely yeah. want to customize it that way. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a reason why people who are obsessed with Nintendo have like eight 3DSs, right? Of because the different they love, designs, like, the different yeah. Designs, and they love getting like new skins for the plain ones, and yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a huge market. I will never understand that as long as I live until I die. <laughs> I will never get it. I just can't. Yeah, it's, one is enough. I feel it's an issue. Of uh, course it is. Apparently, if you it's enough, you don't need more. If you try and take your skin cool. off, apparently it can take some of the co the coating of the controllers off in the process. Yeah, so I read that too. It's it's crazy. The design yeah. of this thing is really weird. Like I like it a lot. I think it's like a sleek looking system. I think it fits. It's comfortable. Um, I don't like the fact that the charging port's at the bottom because yes. they yeah. sell an app. Because so so if I want to use this like in my office while video is rendering, I just I want to kickstand it up and just put it on my desk and play. I mean, you I'm only gonna get a couple hours of battery in. life. And I can't charge it. I can't plug that it in. Really, you're it. absolutely right. That does not make any sense. The kickstand is yep. like why? So they sell a they sell a portable dock that you can dock it on. No. Of course they do. Yeah, they uh -huh. you can get a portable dock. You can put it on as like a stand that also charges. Genius. That's like. It's just like a way of other fuckers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, this is the same company that in certain markets sold 3DSs without chargers because they yes, assumed you probably that. already have one. Yes, I remember that. The that that was their claim anyway. It's like, oh, they totally yeah. don't want to sell you a charger for 10 bucks that cost them a dollar to make. No, no. I mean, that, it's crazy. It's understandable to some extent because the profit margin, especially on new console releases, is low. And I mean, for many companies, it's non existent. They often sell those, con there's a loss. Nintendo historically has not sold consoles at a loss, which often means they sell you a ton of accessories or expensive controllers, et cetera, to make up for yeah. that fact. Yep. Or they try and just sell you a lot of games, which pretty good way of doing it. Don't complain about Every that. Everything is so expensive. The Pro Controller, so when I went and grabbed 70 this, bucks for that thing, right? Seven, I grabbed the Pro pricey. Controller, $70 for just uh, basically what is an Xbox 360 controller for the Nintendo, or for the Switch, $70. And then the, 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 again, another dock, $90. You want to play as a kickstand and also charge it? There's an extra money. Like they just keep gouging you for just as much as they possibly can. The other thing that I hate 
And it's just so fucking Nintendo because they're so afraid of people like hacking their system. Mm-hmm. Is that the save games don't save on the cartridge. You can't transfer Every- saves between systems. You can't transfer. So you yeah. can't. So if your Nintendo Switch kicks it and you need a new one, you just start fresh on everything. You don't get to keep like my Zelda save is on my consoles, not on my goddamn cartridge. Mm. That that blows my mind. Yeah, that they're afraid of being able to use that as a back door. I mean, if I yeah, they're correct. so afraid it's going to get hacked. I'm like, it was dude, the Wii. Dude. It was the Wii, right? That they were able to use a sort of save game exploit to do stuff like run. Um, oh god, what was that? Project M, uh, that Smash Brothers oh, yeah, modification yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff. That they yep. they use that. Uh, so I guess they're very worried. I mean, let's be honest. Like quite a few handhelds have been heavily affected by piracy. The DS being one of them. You know, the R, the R four cartridges and stuff like that. Big piracy market for that kind of thing. So they're likely wanting to avoid that as much as possible. PSP mm. ended up There's having no a bunch of piracy. There's no cloud either, chat either. There's no cloud well, that doesn't surprise me. Nintendo's years behind in terms of the online system. So it, that's quite surprising. Uh, not surprising at all. Uh, the other controversy that popped up is their, their statement regarding dead pixels on the system. Uh, oh, they yeah. they are saying that dead pixels are normal for LCD screens. A small number of stuck or dead pixels are characteristic of LCD screens. These are normal and should not be considered a defect. That's a statement on the official <laughs> yep, website. Yep. You got dead pixels? Uh, yeah, it's fine. It's part of it. What? Don't worry about it. That may yeah. have been true yeah. 10 years ago. Oh, girl, you got dead pixels? Uh, girl, it's part of the product. That, that yeah. may have been true 10 years ago, but dead pixels are not as common anymore. Not, no. F- not full on dead pixels. There are such things as floating pixels or dim pixels and things like that that are like, oh, they're not working as well as they should be, but a full on dead pixel? And I don't. I and they're run, like in a row. I don't too, have really two or three in a straight my, line. Like it's, it's. You need a cluster. I mean, it varies from company to company as to what the policy was. There was a notorious leak from an Apple store in 2010. This is still seven years ago, by the way, where the geniuses were told that you on a MacBook you would could need up to a, to 15 dead pixels to get a replacement. Cool. And there would often be there need to be a cluster or two of these or the pixel anomalies as they were calling them. Pixel but it varies, pixel anomalies. Anomalies, yes. <laughs> it varies from company to company though. Like displays are now classified by tiers. Like I think if I and please correct me if I'm wrong, chat, because I'm not being into TVs, a class zero panel, if I recall correctly, which is what a lot of premium televisions use, is a panel with zero dead, dim, or floating pixels of any sort. Uh, bear in mind these are big we're talking about big 4k tvs here with huge right. pixel density i don't have to my knowledge a single dead pixel on either of my monitors that i've been running 24 7 for the last three years and i've got yeah. a 27 inch 1440p and a 24 inch 1080p both running at high refresh rates there are no yeah. dead pixels on any of my monitors my television doesn't have any my fucking projector doesn't have any and the here's the the problem i've got is not the whole oh well they shouldn't have to replace a uh, console with one dead pixel yeah i get it dead pixels happen i get that the problem is it's a very small display with a low pixel density yes, it's a 720p so say, display it's only 720p so they're so noticeable yeah. if if there was a dead pixel on my ipad pro which has a retina display it would be much harder for me to notice because those pixels are crammed in real fucking tight yeah, yeah. the pixel density on that thing is ridiculous the pixel density on that it, it's a 720p screen that's not high pixel density very yeah. easy to you spot uh, a few pi- a few dead pixels would cause a much bigger problem on a system of that size. And I, I know for a fact that the policy for returning my Samsung phone for dead pixels is much more generous than that. Uh, it's, it, it just seems like, I mean, for one, I'd love to see what are the exact numbers of dead pixels you need to get a proper re- refund on this thing. Mm. Like, And also not being so flippant about it would be nice. It, it's a handheld yeah. system with a low yeah. pixel density display you will fucking notice. Yep. There's no doubt about it. So there needs to be a decent policy for it. It needs to be clearly explained. I'm not saying one dead pixel, massive refund, but, you know, I want to know how many. Let's hear something reasonable. Yeah. Apparently that's it's, so... people are saying it's three, uh, which is not, that's not terrible. That's a decent, I think that that's not bad. Uh, at least it's not like 15 or whatever. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, but I just don't like the statement that it's like, oh, this is totally normal. Yeah. So, well, no, it's not. Shit it's happens, actually, y'all. Yeah, yeah right. It's like, actually not. On. And if you compare it to many other companies, they're far more stringent about such things. Admittedly, you're not talking about a $4,000 designer monitor. You're talking about a $300 handheld console. You're not even talking about a $600 smartphone. Right. It's, a, it's a cheap piece of hardware. 
that mm-hmm. was built cheaply with cheap components. It has a plastic screen, for God's sake. Mm-hmm. All right, there's no big surprise there. Of course, the other issue has been the uh, the left Joy-Con sync and disconnection issue that some people have apparently fixed by literally resoldering the antenna in a slightly different direction. Oh yeah, my not, God! I'll Inside just stick with my pro controller. Thank you very much. Uh huh. Yeah. So the, the quite a few people are reporting pro it. Too. <laughs> yeah. No, I was like, I'm like, I'm, just, I'm gonna spend the seventy dollars because my- quality of life. I probably want like, that anyway because I, I think I don't know what what do you guys think about the size of the Joy Cons? Like they seem really small to me. They they're no small to me. The mapping of them, like I hate the mapping of them. The way the way that everything is set up is hard for me. And at first I was like, maybe it's because my hands are small. And I was like, no, this is a system that kids are supposed to use. Like it's not, yeah, it's yeah. just awkward. It's awkward feel when you have like the screen and the Joy Cons on there and you're playing it like a handheld system. It's awkward feeling. It's a little and Sam, awkward. Yeah, yeah, Sam was watching me and I kept adjusting my hands up and down. And he was like, why are you doing that? And I was like, because I can't, like when I'm playing Zelda, right? Like I need to, I want to use both of these so that I can be moving around and adjusting the camera, right? But then like, if I'm fighting, I need to slide this hand up a little yep, bit. It's so this one. Ah. As I was going to say, the most problematic one is the right it's, Joy-Con. It's the right one, yeah. Because of the way they have the the you know the joystick for the camera is directly below the buttons you need, so you're constantly shifting up and down. And when you're playing other games too, this is this is the most uncomfortable fucking thing in the world. Having the joystick in the middle is just <laughs> the worst, and it's also tiny as hell. Right. Uh, but this, it's just the placement of this joystick feels off. Mm. Yeah. It doesn't feel right. Um, and I hate how hard it is to push on the plus and minus in the oh, in they're the so tiny they're really tiny and games like zelda make you press them all the time all the time and while you're you're like holding it right and you try to hit that minus but in order to hit the minus you're kind of like maneuvering your hand around the other yeah. joystick and so you accidentally click in the other joystick so then you're crouching and you're like oh, what the fuck? that's not what i wanted to do you're like <laughs> oh my god it's a it's a fucking nightmare for me. So you spend seventy dollars to get a pro controller. So you get a fucking pro controller. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> yep. I mean, I don't think like playing like this. I actually don't think it's that bad. It's really just the right joystick. It's 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 awful placement. I haven't. Tried, have you tried Dodger playing it with the two Joy Cons out and like having it as a kickstand and using the toy, two Joy Cons? I have not. I have it's not fucking, tried doing that. It's awkward feeling. Like it's just. I'm so maybe just 30 years of me playing like, a, you know, like this, but having like the freedom to just kind of be like, what am I going to do with these? Hmm. It just doesn't feel natural. It feels you know, I wonder really if I'd weird. be okay with that because well, I played quite a few games with the Wii Remote Nunchuck and actually quite right. enjoyed it, uh, especially with first person shooters. I thought it was a great way to control it. I wonder if I'd be okay with that. But yeah, as you're saying, it's not even tied together with anything. It's the complete freedom. It's like, whoa, where do my hands go? Ah. Not, only, not only that, but the difference between the Wii Remote and the Nunchuck is that these you have two joysticks you're playing with you're not true. just having the one where you just have buttons on the other yeah true. so it's a little bit it's like i i just i want i want my pro controller or at least stick them into that little square thing that is the most ugly controller when you put the two joy cons oh, in the little holder the, the nintendo dog because it looks what? like it looks like a dog if you put eyes on yeah, it yeah 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 yeah, yeah exactly yeah Let's no that nintendo is, edition of that problem that solved. thing feels cheap as hell too, millions of copies it's not good pro controller go for the if you have the money, spend the 70. It sucks that it's 70. It should not be $70. At most 50, maybe 30 or 40. This, I mean, the Switch is not a $300 system. You know, you're not yeah. going to do anything yeah, with that. Not. You need an SD card. You probably need a pro controller. Yeah. And you certainly need a game. You're looking at more like a $500 investment. That's what I drew. That's what I spent about five. Yeah. Right around there. Yeah, so obviously quite a lot of issues with the machine on launch. Not unusual to have consoles with launch issues, of course. Remember back to the 360 with the Red Ring of Death. Remember back to the first PlayStation 2s that were burning their lasers out within six months. A <laughs> uh, yeah. few models. Again, I think the 360 issue of if you stood it vertically, it had a tendency to eat discs. So it would just yep. grind them to a fine paste, which is not exactly what you wanted. <laughs> Take the disc out. It's just a mess on the back. Yeah. Oh, were- the Miata. That was, that was fun working at GameStop during that time and then bring it in. And they'd be like, my game's defective. I'm like, oh, okay. And you Pop look it at, open, yep. look at the back of the disc go, did you move your Xbox 360? And they were like, I, I no. worked a game at that point when that was going down. And yeah, we had a lot of that. It's like, it looks like you've like put this to the, you've attached this to the bottom of your shoe and gone skiing through Scraped gravel. It. Yes. It's, it's incredible. 
or people coming in with their with their red ring and just like wanting a new one but they can't afford it so i'm like all right here's your home solution take a bunch of towels turn on your 360 oh, and let that it was sit. terrible yeah that was a way to fix it because they like re-soldered like the the graphics it was card a temporary solution yeah it, <laughs> yeah it, it was, was i mean hell you go back to the i remember the dreamcast and i remember christmas morning and this is when my dad learned to hate video games uh, my dad bought me uh oh, bought my me, dad me and my brother hate video games me and a my brother by john bain our first, you by <laughs> our first ever brand new games console a dreamcast around launch uh he bought us that for christmas with sonic adventure and sega rally 2 super excited we got one of the ones that resets itself after a few seconds oh, no. because no. there is a and we didn't know this at the time you you have to do this to a lot of dreamcasts now to keep them working because it's a a common problem with older dreamcasts uh it's just a, a design flaw you had to screw this thing you had to tighten the screw back up again to start but we had to send the whole thing back and my dad was furious the whole day and I, he's never played a video game since he hates video games now and it's all sega's fault fuck you sega <laughs> you, you ruined christmas <laughs> It's the saddest story ever told. <laughs> you did. You ruined Christmas. Uh, on the plus side, at least when I got it back, I got Power Stone with it, so that was cool. So, Power Stone's awesome. Oh, yeah. And then I, I browbeat my brother into buying the games I wanted. We used to pool our pocket money on them, but I would always convince my brother to buy the game I wanted instead of the one he did. I was actually a terrible person. <laughs> I was going to uh, say, by convince, you mean manipulate? Yeah, I manipulated <laughs> him. It's getting Trick Style and uh, Speed Devils and a bunch of other shit that he clearly didn't want. But hey. That's, I mean, if you're the older brother, that's just the responsibility you have mm. to ensure, you've got to ensure that you don't buy bad video games because of your younger brother's ignorance. <laughs> I, Look, I was, fact. I was doing yeah. him a favor. Yeah. I was doing him a favor on that. Agreed. All right, yeah, so that was that. Uh, as I said, uh, people are very excited about the Switch, but certainly not without its problems on launch. So we'll we'll see what can be fixed. Going Just wait for the and... new Switch 3DS XL. Well, I mean, you, you know they're going to do an iteration. They'll do a new yeah. SKU. Uh, I'm interested maybe in waiting because if the controllers are anywhere near as uncomfortable as the original 3DS was, I'd be waiting for the XL version because they hurt my fucking hands using mm -hmm. that controller. So I'm not looking forward to potentially using that. Uh, all right. So moving on, there were couple of other little topics we wanted to deal with. The problem is I've forgotten what they were. They were obviously very exciting. <laughs> uh, God, it sounds like they were just hot off the press. Thrilling, <laughs> no doubt. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, so the yeah, For Honor oh, is yeah. uh, getting a bit Ubisofted um, or Ubishafted, yeah. if <laughs> you want to know. So according to... The Steam charts, you know, the websites that track the number of concurrent players. Bearing in mind, of course, that this is not the only place to play For Honor. You could buy it on Uplay. <laughs> uh, if you wish. Uh, I think the only people playing it on Uplay are the guys with press copies that are forced to. Like, obviously, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah mine is too. Uh, I just got my Wild Lads code through that as well. But uh, the player base has dropped over 50% in just two weeks and is trending downwards. This is a very similar trend to what The Division saw after the first couple of weeks, which is concerning for a number of reasons. It, it's a shame. Uh, the Division, I understand, because The Division was fucking bland as shit, but the mechanics of For Honor, like the actual 1v1 mechanics, are really good. Really yes. fun. Totally yeah. agree. T I great, agree. It's a great fighting game. Because that's it what is, it is. It is. It's an excellent fighting game. Yeah, I very really entertaining. love it. But they like forgot to focus on that and decided to focus on other shit that didn't matter, like Dominion Mode, because Dominion Mode is garbage. Gear, gear drops that affect how powerful you are in these Dominion Mode things. And it feels like they just had two development teams being like, we're going to make a fighting game and we're going to make a MOBA esque fighting game, working on two different things and coming together and they're like, all right. And now we're going to have this overworld that you're going to fight for that nobody's going to care about. And well, yeah. that's, that's that, that, that little meta game is, in my eyes, just utterly pointless. I have no investment yeah. in it. Pointless. I mean, I'm so sick of seeing the axes flying down. I don't oh, my care, God. Man, I, I don't care. It makes you, it makes you watch it. Makes you watch it. Yeah. I want to skip yeah. it every it's time. Like the, the test you haven't played for seven hours. Yeah. Here's what's happened. Wing, witching. I'm like, I don't care. So yeah. it's worth noting that the game is not dead. It's not dead. 
It's no, it's nowhere it's near not. dead yet. It still has a very strong concurrent player base. Currently, there are twelve thousand people playing on Steam. That's a good number. That's mm. a, it's a pretty damn good number. Yes, it's dropped from its forty-five thousand all-time peak, certainly, but it's still a good number. The problem becomes as the player base declines, and you have a bunch of different modes, and you have a matchmaking system that is frankly absolutely awful. Oh God! Yeah. You are going to have some severe problems being matched to the right kind of people. Especially bearing in mind the amount of push that was be uh, has been made towards Dominion in the marketing. Again, I told told you this time and again, they snuck a fighting game past people, but they marketed it as the Dominion mode. The problem yeah. is if you want to play one versus one, two versus two, and the other less popular modes, you are going to have longer queue times, and you're going to be matched up with people that have wildly differing skill levels, which makes the game far less enjoyable. I mean, even on launch, the matchmaking was awful. We're being matched against guys who, in Dominion, were like Prestige 4 and 5, who had objectively better gear than we did, not to mention who were better players than we were. So it was a double whammy of fuck this. In the 1 versus 1, the population queue last week and the week before was already low. So as it continues to decline, you're going to see that mode become more and more difficult to play. Which sucks, because that's the good mode. It is the good mode. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I couldn't agree more. It's the one versus one, two versus two, the way to go with that game. Yep, 100%. It's potentially a problem. And I'd say it's more of a problem than it is with The Division. Uh, the Division is mostly PvE. Even mm -hmm. if The Division had a small player base, you can still play it with a squad of four people and do fine. For Honor yep. is essentially purely a PvP game. So as that player base falls you will see that game start to develop new problems because i feel like for honor could have been the next like siege for them rainbow six siege if they just focused on the right stuff yeah the system mm -hmm. for honor is a mediocre game that i want to see a sequel to that does bad like takes all the lessons and be like this is what we're good at and focus on that because man for honor is a mess and the peer-to-peer -peer system has to go stop making me play multiplayer peer-to-peer where I get these lag ninjas flying all oh over the God, place, kicking my bullshit. ass. Like, I don't need that crap. Even Give if the teleportation servers. bullshit wasn't happening, the consistent disconnections and hangs in the middle of the game are yep. annoying as fuck. And again, fine for one versus one, not for 4v4. Even Absolutely 2v2, not. I had issues. Me and uh, Northern Lion were playing. And at one point, the guy, like one of the guys dropped and it loaded back in. And now I couldn't move. And the dude was just running up to me, wrecking my shit. And I'm like, I can't move. And yeah. now I'm dead. Yeah, the... That's not brilliant whatsoever. And as much as people say, well, you know, it's great because they won't turn the servers off. What do you think all of the progression is tied to? Yeah. Like, they totally do have servers. That's why yeah. you couldn't play the game at various points over the last few weeks because the servers went down. I tried to play it a few nights ago. The servers were down. They have servers. They just don't <laughs> use them to host the gameplay. They use them to yep. track all of your progress and microtransactions and do the matchmaking. If they turn those off, it doesn't matter if the game connection's peer-to-peer. -peer, you ain't getting shit out of that. Right. Uh, yeah, so we'll see. I mean, they could, they could definitely turn it around. It could become a Rainbow Six Siege where it had a flagging launch and then was able to recover and grow past the launch. But it will require a lot of good support, a lot of good additions, and we'll see what if they're able to do that. I, I think the thing that Siege had over For Honor is that its core gameplay mode was very compelling and almost yes. infinitely replayable, to the point where they didn't really need other gameplay modes. Those three, like, attack-defense scenario modes were all you really needed. You just needed more maps and more characters to make them more interesting. With For Honor, I don't, if they're going to put all their eggs in the Dominion basket, I think they're going to be in trouble. It's, it's, yeah. Dominion is fucking hot garbage. It's bad. I don't like it. No, uh, I don't it's, it's chaotic. There's, there's the minions just get in the way and it's frustrating and you get like 2v1, it, the, 3v1. It's, you know. Yeah, it's, it, yeah. Once it's 2v1, 3v1, you're dead. Too easy for people really, to run away. Yeah. I really, really wonder what the game would have been like if they had marketed it and focused it as a fighting game. It would have sold about five copies, probably. <laughs> That's yeah. why they didn't do that. Fighting games yeah. don't sell that many copies. I'm sorry, it just doesn't happen. That yeah. sucks. Yeah, unless they're big IPs. Yeah, and, and even then, you know, Street Fighter V has very why disappointing sales. Why make a fighting game? Because that's what they did. I mean, it's because they wanted to, you know, and honestly, a third-person weapon-based fighting game like that is, in my opinion, pretty unique. In many it ways, is. It's, it's awesome. I in many ways, it. it's Bobby's first fighting game, but that's cool. Kind of. It's yeah. it takes less to master, but it's still got a good amount of depth, and it gives mm -hmm. it gives me that uh, the same thrill that I get from fighting games without the two hundred hour learning curve. It gives you the I don't same hate salt that too. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs>
As soon as I figured out Crendor's uh, game, he decided he needed to leave. Just saying. <laughs> I'll never let him forget that. It's like, oh, I've got to go now. It's like, wait, I just, I just started beating you. <laughs> Time to go. Uh, Time to go leave. play Donkey Kong 64. Da, 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 Banjo Kazooie. <laughs> exactly. Oh, dear. Uh, yeah, uh. so uh, we'll see. It's, and I think that obviously, it, I mean, hell, the, the, if Ubisoft's throwing out a bunch of stuff, and the amount of releases that are coming over the next few weeks are going to take big holes out of For Honor's player base, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, absolutely. In many ways. In it's already, many ways. Yeah. I don't, I would, it's, it's a shame is what I'll just keep saying. Cause I think there was such, there's such potential with that game. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's still good. It's still a good game. You know, yeah. here's something to do, pull a rainbow six. And then a year's time and come back and say, wow, that was really a much better game. Now that's really, really so. good. Yeah. yeah. I'm not, I'm not We've wishing it for before. its failure. I'm not one of those people. I don't wish for games failure. Yeah, but no, not at all. I just, I just want them to be better. Cause there's a, there's a good game under there somewhere. Just a lot of problems. Peel with it. off the Ubisoft scum. Indeed. You just gotta scrub it off with a nice little uh, <laughs> wire brush. Uh, not, last piece of news before we go to releases. So there has been an announcement regarding something called the Xbox Game Pass. This is a subscription based service separate from Games for Gold. And it is an unlimited access service which allows you to play apparently more than 100 games for $9.99 a month. So you could view it as kind of the Netflix for games or whatever. Obviously, the, with the size of the download, I don't think that's really true. I think PlayStation Now was more like the Netflix for games because you could play instantly. These are like 50 gig downloads, so maybe not. But mm. it gives you, as long as you continue to subscribe, uh, access to a lot of titles. And it's not that they're by no means the first service to do this. Uh, EA, of course, did their vault and access kind of last year, year before. I'm subscribed mm. to that. I've, I feel like I've got pretty good value out of it. The 10-hour trials for new games, plus the yeah, amount of good. games they put in the vault. There's a lot of gameplay in there. You know, there's a lot of really good stuff. And some people will say, well, you don't really own them. I'm like, you know what? I actually don't really care because <laughs> I'll probably $5 play... a month. I'll probably, it's 10 bucks a month, at, at least for this. Um, uh, EA, the EA access is cheaper. But it's like, I'll play the game and probably not pick it up again. Yeah. And if I want to pick it up, I'll pick it up. Uh, this, the nice thing about this is being able to try it or beat a short campaign and say, right, well, I've done that and I didn't need to buy a $60 game to do it. Yeah? $60 is six months of subscription to this 100 plus game service. I don't actually care if I don't own the games at that point. Yeah. I, I, I am all in favor of services like this. Man, it just, that shines a light on how bad the Switch one is going to be. Oh it's god, like, yes. Here, have a, have a 30 day trial of a, of a virtual NES console game, game and then we're going to oh, take it back from you. It always comes back to the Switch. God, that's such a dumb decision. Sorry, it's, sorry, it, sorry. You I just don't understand. Like, today. there's two. There's like ten years of, of internet services that you can look at Nintendo and go, "That's successful." I wonder why. Oh, they give out free games with a monthly subscription. Hell, maybe if we just give you one of our SNES or NES titles for free a month and you get to keep it, people are going to sign up for that. Don't Even then, that's pretty away. bad value. I mean, It I is just... bad value. It <laughs> absolutely is bad value. But the fact that they're taking it back taking after it 30 away. days. Yeah. You can't even keep it even if you wanted to. <laughs> oh, Fucking dear. hell, man. Jesus. Anyway, no, that sounds like a great service. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I, I'd also say it would not surprise me in the slightest if companies are coming up with this service because they are trying to undercut and drive away the influence of GameStop. Because in my eyes, this makes used games far more irrelevant than they currently are. Like, why would I go and buy a $40 used game when I can play over 100 titles? Many of them, are, you know, the, according to this, the, these are good. These are good games. They're good games, yeah. Brent. They're... <laughs> There's, there's stuff that you'd actually want to play. I was like, all right, okay, so I can have four months of this or I can buy a used copy of a game at GameStop. Hmm, yeah. which will I choose? Unless there's a very specific game that I want, I'm going to go with this. Of course I'm going to go with this. And I have a feeling that this is, a, this is not just a shot across the bow, this is aimed directly at GameStop. Because, mm -hmm. let's be honest, games companies don't like GameStop. Why would they? They... They've been trading in used games and not giving any of that profit to the devs and publishers for decades now. GameStop are viewed, I think, at best as a necessary evil by the industry and at worst as now direct competition. Because, of course, with digital distribution, we don't need GameStop anymore. Right. We don't. It's, they're completely irrelevant. You can sell I mean, directly I, to the consumer. 
that's how I played Mirror's Edge Catalyst is by the the subscription fee yeah. for the EA right. Origin. I'm like, five bucks a month. I got my X amount of hours out of it. I'm, I was like, I don't want to beat this game. It's not that great, but it I was fun. I a bunch of uh, Garden Warfare 2 that way. Yeah, exactly. No, GameStop is a heaping pile of trash. Mm. Everything's sorry, terrible. What? The podcast. <laughs> They're a fantastic company. Everything's <laughs> awful. The podcast is what this and is. So, yeah, and so so is N- Nintendo. Oh, uh, Nintendo is great. Can do no wrong. Company. No wrong. I went to GameStop. I went Je- to GameStop Jenna immediately. Before I went to Target, which is where I got my Switch, I went to GameStop like an idiot. And I just wanted to be like, hey, when are you getting a, like? Are you getting another shipment in anytime soon? They're like, well, what we're doing is we're taking pre-orders for bundles that are five hundred dollars or more that'll uh, ship that on April sixteenth. Right. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. I remember what what like to work here. I gotta yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, let's leave now. Yep. So that that service is going to be available uh, again. I don't I don't see the downside of it. I think that's that's pretty great, and it's awesome to have. If you're sitting at home and like, you know what? I feel like just playing a game today that I probably don't own. Having access to all of those instantaneously, at least as fast as you can download them, is pretty cool to me. And it may very well allow people to try out games they otherwise wouldn't have tried and maybe broaden their horizons a bit. So I'm all in favor of this. We've got already got at least one service, possibly more, on, on PC that do that. So great. Yeah, do it. Absolutely. Why not? Sounds good. Mm. Hell yeah. Jesse, you're intrigued by something. Yeah, you look like you're having a good what time. No, I just, it's a <laughs> wonderful conversation about a game I don't play and then moving on to a thing I don't know. <laughs> I've <just> like, <laughs> got your 2B statue, man. You're good. I got nothing. Yeah, I got nothing to say. I can't talk about, you know, stuff that I'm like, do you want to talk about the release list that you curated this week? Yeah. Boy, do I ever. <laughs> if the game you like is missing, it's Jesse's fault this week. Yeah. So you don't no, get to complain. No, no, no. I kept everything good and don't worry. <laughs> I don't believe you in the slightest. Cool. I'm ready. Well, I'm gonna... Starting with today, March 7th, we have Dark Legion VR. Okay. Well, you, you kept a VR game in the list. I'm intrigued. <laughs> All right. I know. It's a first-person shooter and magic game. You can move freely using HTC Vive and teleport yourself. All of the scenes are open and free. Huge battle scenes, advanced game level design, early access VR shooter. What 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 sort of attracted you to this? Uh, I was like, we need at least one stupor in here to keep the meme going. Oh, Other okay. than that, not really. It's not anything. really a stupor, though, is it? You, <laughs> you can move around free. freely in this thing. Well, I guess Sounds it's like kind of a stupor. They should have taken open and free and slapped down on a Ghost Recon Wildlands as their tagline. Oh dear. You are you are a salty man Super today. Super salty, sorry, yeah. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Continue, yeah. continue. Jesus. All right, the next game is called Leaves the Journey. Looks like a little Leaves indie game, a little indie point and click, yeah, maybe. It's a Didalic game, and it looks really weird and interesting. And I was like, it's a puzzle game, but bizarre. So you're in. You know what this looks like? Right. An old claymation point and click adventure. I can't remember the name of it. Yep. This reminds me of Amanda. Neverhood. Uh, but the Neverhood as well, but it reminds me a bit of Aminata, a little bit of Machi- Machinarium in here. Machinarium mm. so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting that vibe. Cool. Uh, next up is Ghost Recon Wildlands, which we've mm-hmm. talked about a bunch. Indeed, um, we have. Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, which TB talked about. Yep. Uh, the new today. Nancy Drew game, The Shattered Medallion. I kept this one in for you, dudes. Thank this you. Is for you. Mostly because <laughs> the... finding this is hard because there's so many Nancy Drew Holy games. Holy crap, you aren't kidding. I try, there it is. I finally found it in Shattered Medallion. No one is immune to sudden death in this reality TV show. You're right. <laughs> this reality TV. What is it even That's about? the description. Hey, this says it's released May 20th. Wait, no, 2014. It's, it's old. Got it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, maybe they ported it or whatever. Yeah, this is this came out a couple of years ago. Sweet. <laughs> For some reason. Um, the next one, I've, I feel like oh I've heard God. a decent amount so, of sorry, I was, I was just looking at the, the faces of the people in this game, and they're terrifying. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. And Nancy Drew or Loot Rascals? Uh, it, no, and Nancy Drew. It, ah. they're, they're terrifying. Trust me gotcha. on this. All right, well, Loot Rascals. Yes, Loot this, Rascals, this they are great. also kind of terrifying. Kind of, yeah. It. This love looks it. awesome. I'm looking for, I'm going to think I'm going to play this later. I have code for it, and it looks kind of great. Yeah. It's super fun. Were you playing this on stream not too long ago? Uh, I played it for Fan Friday a while ago, yeah. Maybe. I feel like I watched somebody play it, and it looks interesting. Yeah, well, it's a fun what, game. What's the lowdown on it? 
Uh, okay, so you are essentially a very, I'm going to say British, very British astronaut with a very British like, robot AI. Okay. Then you get stranded on a planet. Right. And, um, your whole objective is to escape, but it's a, it's a turn-based roguelite where you, uh, depending on the time of day, uh, enemies will switch from being either uh, more defensive or more or have more attack, and you sort of um, build up your character with cards, and they increase your stats. But what the way it works is that the cards, some of them have stats that are like, uh, if a card is to the left of this, this card gets a plus one. Nice. Or some like say that. if this card is in the bottom row, the card above it gets a plus three, like like that cool. kind of stuff. So you have to order your cards and then know which ones to keep, and then you get a abilities and spells you can shoot fireballs right. and stuff yeah sounds good huh? i'll check that one out uh, yeah it's like one of those one-to-one -one move things so if you move one space everything around you moves and then right. you move again and then everything moves yeah yeah so an right. actual rogue like then cool all right mm -hmm. awesome the next one uh looks like a full-on jrpg atelier Fierce. oh it's Love an atelier it. game and the mysterious journey there's a lot of these atelier games most of them are a bit anime booby i believe there's a lot of anime boobs going on in these games the trailer is just anime. There's not even any gameplay in it. Not a not a not yeah, a bit. Actually, totally right. It is literally just an anime. Oh god. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hell yes. But yeah, <laughs> Hell I'm not yeah. familiar with the Atelier Hell games. Yes. I'm gonna be honest. Next. Next up is Disc Jam. Yo, oh, this yeah. game looks so good. Oh yes. yes. Play yes. it. Win basically Windjammers crossed with Rocket League in a yes. sort of. 3D Unreal 4 environment. It looks pretty fucking great. Yeah. Play it. I want to play <laughs> this. I do. I, I really do. This, this reminds me of my old Ricochet days. I want it. <laughs> I absolutely want it. Um, moving on to console games, Nier Automata, which we talked about. Mm -hmm. That's uh, out in a week on PC, incidentally. Yeah. But it is out now on PS4. Indeed, if you can't wait. Uh, Darknet for PS4. Yeah, this is a. Um, I've only played it in VR, so I do not Me know. Too. Yeah, if it exists in non VR mode, but it's a game where you are you're hacking stuff, and it's it's like a weird connected orbs and things like that. You're you're, it's super interesting. Mm. Okay. The game after that is Lego Worlds for PS4. Yes, this is also it's just hit version one on PC. This has been early access mm -hmm. for ages, and. It's a kind of open worldy Minecrafty sort of Lego thing. Lego, yeah. Which people seem to quite like. Uh, it seemed to get a pretty good reception. I mean, hell, if if there were a brand to use the Minecraft like game, Lego would mm -hmm. be it. No doubt about that. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. Next up is Shift Happens for PS4. It's a two player co op platformer, but you shift your masses of your characters to get through puzzles. I think that's really cool. Yeah, huh. it's, it's how you sort of fling, you fling the other dude across by mm -hmm. changing mass sort of midair and things like that. That's cool. Interesting. Um, Sub-level Zero Redux, also for PS4. Yeah, I actually played the original version of this on PC. It's pretty cool. It's, uh, it's like a randomly generated roguelite six degrees of freedom descent style game. So you're in a spaceship going through sort of a labyrinth and you can collect different randomly generated weapons and loot and stuff. I actually had a pretty good time with this. So I assume this is an updated version for PlayStation. Mm -hmm. And Talisman Digital Edition. No! Jesus, fuck that game. <laughs> no, no, that is. No, no Talisman ever, ever again. Yes, I will play that with anyone anytime. Good, it will talisman. not be me. I can guarantee I will never be involved with Talisman with thee. It's a... It's a I'm a lyrical gangster. Game, Mathis, yeah. and it's. Right. We tried playing the digital version, and it it's was hell. A <laughs> it was a it was amazing. Of randomly generated dice-driven hell is what that is. Dice next, ignore them. It was next. beautiful. Mathis, I'll play with you next. any day of the week. It's on sale for two dollars and thirty cents on Steam. It's so good. It's not worth the misery. Next, Mathis. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Moving on to March eighth, we have Mountain Mind, which looks like it's a VR game. Tell me this game is the coolest fucking game ever existing on VR, ever. That's a high order. I'm the trailer gonna... just opens up with a dude picking up his... It's like, I don't know what the fuck is happening. Whoa, yeah, that's a, that's super a, weird. A weird headbang experience. It's... Um, oh, my God. It's stoner rock music. It's... Uh, oh, you have oh to, my God. You have to headbang in VR. <laughs> and weird visuals like, happen. 
Uh, that is very odd. All right. I love this. Okay. Oh my god. Next up is called Himiko. How the fuck is horror that? game? Oh <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh shit. Who's gonna play this on YouTube? Is it boobs? Not Everyone. Me. <laughs> Everybody. Probably. What? This it... looks awful. What is this? Oh, a it's short, like, dark, what? atmospheric horror puzzle game. Yeah, it's a waifu with a katana in a horror <laughs> yeah. game. Yeah, in like in like three animations. Yeah. <laughs> half, half of the trailer video is just black. Like, yeah, yeah, it makes no sense. Not even footage. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Next up is called One Soul Purpose. S O L E. One Soul Purpose. Here's the thing. This game, like, I can't figure out if it's like amazing looking or not. Because it's beautiful. It looks great. Some of it does. Some of it looks a little bit out of date. Like, there's some gnarly texture work going on in a lot of this, but there's some interesting lighting stuff. I have to wonder if this is one of those Unreal 4 games where it's like, hey, the lighting looks great because it's Unreal Engine and everything else yeah. not so much. The, the trailer just shows a lot of very slow walking. Yeah, like, a lot of walking. I'm happening. waiting for action, and there is no... Oh, oh, we're shooting. We're shooting. We Halo now. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it looks very Halo-esque. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if it is any good. I'll try it. It's a it's a FPS. It might be, but hmm, it's a bit strange. <laughs> it's hard to tell if this is good or not based on the trailer, so I guess I'll have to just try it out. Mm. All right. The, the next game is Sub Siege. It's a RTS strategy game. I've heard of this before. Um, it looks like it's early access. Oh, is it? Was this out on... I thought this was out on... Uh, ios or something at some point but maybe not it yeah it's all this massively multiplayer real-time submarine strategy thing with an oxygen mechanic which i think is really interesting mm -hmm. yeah which looks you can play 12 player battles you got hero like units uh i'm intrigued mm -hmm. yeah i get cool. it's i'm thinking of like subversion or something else like i'm not thinking of the same game but i'm intrigued i want to i want to play this <laughs> Huh. Um, okay, TB, this next game, I need you to, in a very epic voice, read description <laughs> for it. It's called Demon I'll, Lord. I'll try my best. My okay, Demon great. Lord. My lungs aren't working very well, but we'll give it a try. That's true. That's true. Demon Lord is a simulation game. Players control small demon in training and the fight <laughs> by feeding and training to upgrade or keep the small demon best fighting force to defeat the evil and powerful human. In the end, to conquer the world, become the king of great darkness. I feel it should have been separated by commas. In, yeah, like, good. no space. I yep. feel there should have been a Bigly in there somewhere. That made no sense <laughs> at all. I, it's, is it Demon Tamagotchi? Is that what this I game is? I don't know. I have no idea. Apparently it's in a state of continuous improvement, though, and that's probably a good thing. <laughs> My uh, favorite part is they're just using the real world. So one of the scenes is straight up just Africa burning. Cool. But not like, cool, actually. No. <laughs> what? Why is this? Oh, dear. No, okay, moving on. <laughs> the next game is called Fix Me, Fix You. It's a visual novel. Oh, oh, I we have to have always this. one, right? I'm, it looks, it sounds so generic. It says, after losing his girlfriend and his job on the same day, one could easily say that Austin Lewis is having Austin a very Lewis. bad day indeed until a unique opportunity knocks on his door. Is that like a hot grill knocks on his door? Maybe. Search your heart and find yourself, Mathis. <laughs> You want me to do your heart right. and find yourself? I mean, one of the features is that it's sent, set in Santa Barbara, so you know it's going to be good, right? <laughs> Most good, yep. That sounds right. Um, okay, the next game on March 9th is called Pamela. I've heard of this before, and I don't know Ooh, why. This, this look looks interesting. Why have I heard of this? I'm not sure. Apparently, hmm. you have an array of high-tech weapons, highly immersive UI, full body awareness. An unforgettable survival experience of some description. Oh, survival game, God help Of me. some sort. I mean, it's early access because of fucking course it is. But, um... Ah. It looks cool. I mean, it looks neat, yeah. What, yeah I like what the, the theme. Hell you... The theme looks neat. I love... That inventory on your wrist is pretty fucking cool. You, like, you pull your wrist Ooh, up and yeah. your in, your whole, like, menu appears there. That's a nice uh, you, piece the, of UI In the design. map, he does this and, like, the, the map shows up. Yeah, you hold arm. up, like, a globe in your hand. That's... All right, all right. I, I'm interested. I don't know what the gameplay is all about, but I'm intrigued. 
Oh my god, I want to play this next game so uh, bad. I did it for you, dude. I chose <laughs> this, it next, for you. this next game is called Bad Dream Coma. Oh, I and just got sent a code for this. You can have it, because this is not my <gasps> thing. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> um, it looks like a weird a horror game, point and click. It looks very Rusty Lake. Mm -hmm. It looks very Rusty Lake, doesn't it? I was like, is this a Rusty Lake game? But I guess it's not. I did no. get a code for this, too. I knew the fingers in the soup looked familiar. Ah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, the fingers in the soup. I remember this. <laughs> vividly. That mm -hmm. sounds like a part of a novel. The fingers in the soup looked familiar. Uh, I slowly oh, I sat down on the rotting chair, yeah. taking in the ambience around. Mm -hmm. The smell of stench mm. and rot and decay <laughs> filling my lungs. Mm. A small rabbit. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> Very the next, epic. <laughs> the next game for 3DS is Master Blaster Zero. Blaster Master. Blaster Master. Nice. Uh, Blaster Master Zero. Blaster Master. Blaster Master. Blaster Blaster. Blaster Blaster. Blaster Blaster. Blaster Blaster. Blaster Blaster. It's also out for the Switch, I guess. Yeah. A Switch game. And also V-O-E-Z. That's also for the Switch, isn't it? It's yeah. also for the Switch. I don't know what that is. No, nope. I don't either. What is it, Jesse? Uh, it's a game that I don't remember. <laughs> I, I chose, you I chose it for this a reason. List. Come on. I can't, yeah, I chose for a reason. I just don't know why. It's a, uh, a rhythm game. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. And it's just a, like a, I mean, it looked neat. All right. That's really it. I mean, oh, here's right. the thing. It's also on, it's just like an indie game. It's also on iTunes. So it's not like anything. It just looks neat. Okay. Like All right. Oh. Um, next up on March 10th, we have Deviria, which looks like a top down action game. Deviria, Heroes of Eternity, is it? An ancient mm -hmm. scene has cursed the land. Uh, yes. I mean, I, it looks a bit basic Diablo, yeah. I guess. A bit more it was, action it in it. Much different than anything else that came out that day. A lot of uh, <laughs> finding weird shit on yeah. your screen kind of games. Yeah. Yeah, it, it looks a little bit more Soulsy than it's a lot more dodging and avoiding deadly attacks than Diablo is there. So, mm -hmm. do not look too terrible. Um, there is a new Hack Me game, Hack Me 2. Hack Me, Hack You? Hack Me, Hack You. Hack Me? <laughs> There's a story about no, Hacker Beginner. Hack Me! No, Hacker You! Going... Okay, oh, can, can, I, can I do a readout for this description as well? Because, holy crap, yes. this won't take very long. Hack Me 2 is a story about Hacker Beginner who is going to confront to New World Order. <laughs> Where is no place for personal secrets? <laughs> a small rabbit. If you go to the fourth or fifth screenshot, the search engine is Booble. Naturally. And I just, I don't know why that, that's awesome. Must buy, day one, next. Love it. Oh uh, God, it's Bunny Bounce This one is a Jesse game called Bunny Bounce. This was, this, this was in last week's release, or the week, even the week before. Can I, can I read this. this description? Oh, feel free. <laughs> <clears throat> Can you help navigate Tomo through the pitfalls of work and maintain his sanity in the face of animal instincts, carnal lusts, and girls clad in lingerie in this fun, tongue-in-cheek, etchy vigil novel with multiple endings? I think we probably could if we had the desire to do so. I, I can't don't. resist. I can't uh -huh. resist either. Uh -huh. Animal instincts and carnal lust? Oh, God, I the art in this looks lust, terrible. It's not uh, yes. Next. Can you resist the camel lust? <laughs> and the camel next lust? Game. The next game is called Blink. Side scroller platformer. That's yeah, uh, you yeah. can walk on light, solve puzzles by manipulating lights and blinking between worlds. Apparently, I think it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's got a nice little art style to it. Yeah, gives cool. me a little bit of that Monument Valley vibe, so things like that. Mm -hmm. The next game for March 11th is called Abatron, a multiplayer action strategy shooter. I literally could not tell what the fuck was happening in this game, and I had to show it to you guys. That's really the truth. This Abitron. looks like the Joke. sort of game where TV could <clears throat> pull it apart better than we could. Uh, yeah. I literally, so much is happening in this trailer. It's mm, like... There's a few games that try to do this sort of thing. It's the, the ability to like, you can jump into different units and control them in either first or third person in real time and all that sort of thing. Right. And you leap between them. Uh, a bit Battlezone-esque, a bit Savage-esque, uh, that sort of thing. Don't know how good it is. I've not really seen it done all that well most of the time. And it becomes a bit of a clusterfuck. It's usually better done with multiplayer. Uh, it does have multiplayer and online multiplayer, though, so maybe it will work. Hmm. Uh, next game is called Helium. Looks kind of interesting. A little adventure indie game? Question yeah, mark. I just thought this looked really, really so, bizarre. It's a like, sci-fi first-person shooter. Yeah. Uh, are we looking at the same game here? 
hardcore sci-fi first-person shooter? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You said just, it was a little just, un- indie the adventure sci-fi game. It's like, and it looks no. like really interesting. Looks yeah. alien-esque. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a first-person shooter. Mm-hmm. I, just, I just thought we were looking at different games. No. Nope. Uh, uh, all right. Yeah. But the rain effect is pretty fucking cool. I'll give him that. Mm. That's some nice looking rain you've got there. Interesting. I'm I'm intrigued. I don't know what makes it a hardcore sci-fi first person shooter, but yeah. it looks it looks quite nice. I'll give it that. All right. All right, and moving on to March 13th, Save Our Souls, episode one, The Absurd Hopes of Blessed Children. I want to oh play this God. so Fucking badly. What? It looks That's... so ridiculous this looks and nuts. stupid. Yeah, I'm in. I, that is not what I expected when I typed no, this in. No, no, it's not, is it? It's like it's I expected a, anime boobs again. No, it, it's an Unreal mm-hmm. Four driven third person shooter of some sort, uh, and it's episodic. Yeah, how weird is this? I'm I in. don't even know. I, I'm gonna try this though. The crazy part is, it's two characters, all. one player though. Okay. Huh. Whatever. Sure. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All right. And finally, ending on a high note. Oh, thanks, great. Guys, but, <laughs> thanks, Jesse, for this one. Appreciated. <laughs> My boyfriend, he loves me. He loves me not. Uh, Dodger, would you read that description for me, please? Oh, Jesus sure. Christ. Have the summer of your life while being on a fantastic holiday and conquer your dream boy's heart. <laughs> Wait a minute. If I scroll down, what the hell is Annie Kids? Is this something that I don't understand because I about this game? Older. Oh my god, what the hell? <laughs> about this game, it's dogs. There's pictures of dogs and being and hugged a kid as a hugging horse. it. What, what, the, what the fuck? What is that? I don't understand. Is Annie what is all right, okay, we're Googling Annie. What if kids. they're a sponsor? They might what if they sponsored the game? It's possible. And they were Let's like, find out. Annie we'll kids. put your banner in our what game description. The, it's French. Annie Kids is a pa- no, that's actually spelled with two N's. This what? I don't know what that means. You're I, welcome. Is it the name of the developer? Nope. The, the developer is Exocet Games. It's the publisher, apparently. Annie Kids Annie is kids. a. They oh my god! They made the classic My Vet Practice and My oh. Vet Practice Marine Patrol. <gasps> oh my god! I those played those were on games. the list last week. <laughs> Holy crap. Uh, right. Well, You're welcome. I think we well, done, a, well done, Jesse. Note. You truly Holy have uh, scraped shit. the bottom of the barrel with that one. Uh, well, I'm then. Just delighted. That's, the end. That's it. That's the list. Well, if, if your waifu game is missing, it's Jesse's fault this week. Blame him instead. Uh, I uh, kept, I kept, there was some shit this week, guys. I kept <laughs> ones that I was like, this is the least shit of the shit. There was a waifu like, and a boyfu. Oh, my. Mm-hmm. When am I gonna find the boy foo of my dreams? <laughs> <laughs> Why are we calling it guy foo? This is not. This is not guy foo. Yeah, that's good. Guy foo is much better. That's I went in search of my kung fu. The rhyme is there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know kung fu. Do you oh. know kickboxing though? I know no, guy foo. <laughs> no, but I can learn it in three weeks. I'm just gonna go uh, see Van Damme. He'll sort me right out. <laughs> Batista did nothing wrong. Hashtag Batista did nothing wrong. The white guy was the villain. Have I told you the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? <laughs> what? Oh, Brought to God. you by Audible.com. Yep. Tells us Audible. The tragedy. Audible is the name of the company. Audible.com is the name of the website. Audible.com slash cynical is the name of the referral link, which will take you there for a free audio book. Boom! Go pick up something. And you can you too can learn the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise by buying oh, the Darth. Uh, I will I will say that it is significantly better than the one in the Star Wars prequels. So <laughs> he feel becomes free Snoke. To, Come on. Uh hashtag Batista did nothing wrong. Thank you very much for watching the show, folks. What is coming up on our channels this week? Mathus, what you got coming our way? Hello. Uh let's see on the main channel, the Judge Mathis channel. I just released a video uh, last Friday on my big box PC game collection and that growing venture. Uh this Friday I have a video on Theme Hospital going up. And then after that, I have a video on the the weird Diablo-esque from Westwood called Knox. I don't know if anybody knows here knows I what know Nox that one. Is. That is one hell of a game. It is awesome. Um so that'll be in a few weeks. I also do uh, a D&D stream every Wednesday and Thursday uh, at 9 p.m. EST. Uh, at Wednesday is with myself, Sam, M- uh, Bear Taffy, Maggie, and my friend Scott. And then Thursday, Star Wars with myself, Jesse, Crendor, Maggie, and also my friend Scott. And then I do gameplay stuff on the Mathis Games channel every day. Cool. Jesse Cox. Uh, yo, I don't... I'm just going to do stuff before PAX. That's all you need to know. What you really need to do is go to my uh, Twitter, at Jesse Cox. 
And look at my recent tweet where Sam Jackson says he loves hentai. That's literally all you need to know this week. Okay. Man's in my corner. That's <laughs> it. Sammy, my boy, call me. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a watch party. I'll invite the friends over. And we can just sit there and laugh about it. Mm-hmm. That's wow. it. That's all I want to say. Well, Let Jesse Cox go there. That was an unexpected turn, a twist, if you will. Dodger, what do you got? Yes. Um, hi, guys. You can find me at youtube.com slash press start to continue. I do an anime news show, a gaming news show. Stuff's been a little haphazard because I'm moving. But uh, <laughs> there's a new Welcome to the Fandom that went up at the end of last week, if you haven't seen that. And I stream most days. You can find me at twitch.tv slash dexbonus and at dexbonus on everything else. So. Cool. Come hang out. I'll try and make some content this week. Still not 100%. <laughs> like, not fully recovered as of yet. Understandably. I mean, your mouth is a little busted, so... <laughs> I mean, I did have all four of my wisdom teeth ripped out two days after yeah. having major abdomen and gastrointestinal surgery because I'm just too busy for that shit. But, yeah, I, I'll try my best. I still have a big wound in my side that's preventing me from breathing fully, which makes talking kind of hard. I, I'll say this, though. We got a new T-shirt coming out, and it looks like this. There we oh, go. yeah. Oh, yes. Modeling it for you right there. That's uh, awesome. I can't wait for the accusations that it looks suspiciously like one of Dodger's shirts, but never mind. Yeah, how dare you? Indeed. The, the Peasant Slayer t shirt and the Peasant Slayer album poster will be hopefully coming out in the next couple of weeks. Guys, so, I have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I'm going to make a shirt like that too. Do it. It's going to be real on the nose and very awful. As it this is be. a metal band. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. It's metal as fuck. It'll be great. So, yeah, outside of that, I'll try and make some videos this week. I want to do a little bit more streaming. There's tons of games to play. Whether or not I'll have the time to do any of them, I don't know. But a lot of people have been asking what the fuck happened to Shoutcraft Kings in February while well, surgery happened. Our tentative plan, bear in mind this is subject to change, is we're going to do the tournament on the 18th of March. So... I'll keep you posted. Well, you still got a lot of prep and planning to do. So that's going to happen. I think that's pretty much about it. Yeah, I don't... There's no, I'm just thinking... Oh, God, is there anything else? Near? Oh, yeah, one last thing for the limited people that are actually interested in this. I've started doing a wrestling podcast with a, a StarCraft II player by the name of Katz, and I do it on SoundCloud oh, now. So me and Katz, and it's, uh, we're going to add a third host, uh, probably assuming that he's... Not too busy. Kylaris, who is a Heroes of the Storm and StarCraft 2 caster from ESL, to the show. It's called The Smart Tank, and we review pay-per-views, basically. We just put out our review of Fastlane, which is 80 minutes of us complaining about it. So if that is... <laughs> Great. Perfect. If, that, if you want 80 minutes of two grown men complaining about wrestling, then we have that for you at soundcloud.com slash totalbiscuit. Those are episodes are available to download. We have an Elimination Chamber review and the Fastlane review. Of course, our next one will be WrestleMania. I can't wait. Oh, Jesus. We'll see how that one turns out. Hopefully better than the last one. It couldn't have been much worse. But you can find that over at soundcloud.com slash Total Biscuit if you wish to listen to that show. I think that's about it. Thank you very much for watching, folks. Big thank you to our sponsor, Audible, an Amazon company. Audible.com slash Cynical for your free audiobook. Go pick it up. You've got nothing better to do, and reading is for suckers. Thank you very much for watching, folks. Big thanks to our guest today, Mathis. Thanks to Jesse and Dodger. For coming on the show, we'll be back at the same time next week for more Corruptional Podcasts. Goodbye.